And Council Member Soto Martinez. Here. Great. Thank President. you very much. We have three items on the agenda today. Um, and I believe we're ready to take comments from the general public. This is a special meeting. Uh, so uh, folks can speak on agenda items with these three items. Um, there'll be a total of up to two minutes to speak on the agenda items That's, and there's no general questions. comment. So I will now I open it up for public comment. I don't have the tablet in front of me, so I will ask if there are any speakers who want to speak. We have one speaker. Why don't you go ahead and identify yourself and then speak uh, for up to two minutes. Mike Greenspan, uh, happy Ramadan. Gee, we shouldn't be meeting today. It's Ramadan. Board of Public Works isn't meeting. Uh, council's not meeting. And if I was Muslim, for the record, I would sue for being left out. I would actually sue and declare to get this meeting null and void. Now, we're sure out on the chop chop today. It must be important. I even saw a holdover, Matt Sabo here. Now, the uh, requesting all positions about the um, vacant ones. Housing, oh yes, we're really doing a great job housing people. Public works, oh God, what, what a disaster. I live down the street from some terrible streets. Department of Transportation and Planning. Boy, how come the police and fire are exempt in this? We, if we have an emergency in the budget and we're 350 to 400 million in debt, why are we giving exemptions that we can't give? Boy, I tell that union boss of the big officers union what I really think about them. And now the things going also to the Budget and Finance and Innovation Committee. How do I let you know that we are 350 to 400 million in debt? How, I mean, you should have done this long ago. This thing comes from the 27th. We had two weeks and we pick out of all days Ramadan. I mean, go pick that money off the Jewish money trees. But folks, we should not be here. Let's go pick the money, the money we don't have. And you're waiting on money from Sacramento and they ha have a $73 billion budget deficit. There's a good chance that $300 million lifeline you're waiting for will not be here. So fuck you with your phony meetings. And Any other public comment? Is there anyone else? One more, come on up. Thank Good, morning. Good morning, Good morning. council members. Uh, my name is Marlene Fonseca, executive director, EAA Union, representing 6,000 talented and hardworking employees in the city of LA. I'm going to speak on general public comment and item three. For starters, I do want to reiterate that labor and management has always worked together to ensure effective city services and to protect the wellness and the livelihood of employees. This hasn't changed and we will continue to work through these challenges. Sorry, I'm out of breath. <laughs> With that being said, in general, position elimination must be done in the most methodical way possible if it must be done. One size will not fit all for every department. Just because a position has been vacant, please don't take that to mean that it's not needed. The work is still being done. It's being done by the employees who are there. Please look at, at that so that burnout, further burnout is avoided. Another thing to remember is that removing supervisory positions reduces an employee's career ladder. We still feel those effects from the ERIP years ago. And just within the last year or two, we, the union, were still urging departments and working with departments to put those eliminated positions back into their budget. It's taken years and years, and many of them, most of them, still are not back. And this is to help alleviate the employee's workload and to re-offer those promotions that were taken away. Please look at the ratio of subordinates to supervisors be before eliminating these. It's all very important. Also, I don't know, just a thought, is there an opportunity to shelf positions instead of eliminating them? 
Um, just a quick example, during the ERIP, there was a top position eliminated out of one of the call centers and has since been now filled, because again, the work doesn't go away, by sworn, not LAPD folks, just sworn. It's been, it's, uh, been, it's still gone. Those employees that work 25 years never get that opportunity. I did want to touch on payroll and HRP at DOT. Very important to keep those positions. Fiscal system specialists, that's their job. Removing that puts it on an accountant who pays, gets paid half. I'm going to thank look at you all that. very much. And for the record, you, your two minutes were on items two and three. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comment? Hearing none, then, we will move to the uh, agenda. Uh, the way I'd like to proceed is that we go to item two uh, first, which is the uh, uh, Prioritized Critical Hiring, or PCH, and take that report, and then uh, move to, well, let's just move there. Um, Very good. Let's see. Okay, this item two is a CAO report relative to prioritized critical hiring process updates for March 2024. This matter is continued from March 27, 2024. This matter has also been referred to the Budget, Finance, and Innovation Committee. Yeah. Hang on one second before you start. Um, is, there, is it possible to put the screen, uh, to light up the screens for the, for the slideshow, the ones that are in front of us? You can work on that while, while these guys go and while, while ITA is thinking about that. So just to be really clear, um, we will, when we get to our uh, departments, um, which will be um, maybe next, uh, we'll have the Housing Department, uh, the Board of Public Works, um, and those bureaus, you know, Con Ad, Engineering, Sanitation, Street Lighting, Street Services, and then, and then DOT and the Department of City Planning in that order. Uh, we'll take the verbal presentations as we have done in the past weeks. But first, let's get the report from the CIO. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. So the way that we have uh, put together the presentation, we had the priority uh, prioritized critical hiring report. I'm sorry, Matt Zabo, CIO, uh, combined with the proposed vacancy elimination. So uh, what I will do is we'll start with the update on uh, priority critical hiring. Uh, Mr. Seha will provide that report. Then we'll pause uh, if you want to complete that item. And then uh, I'll pause the presentation and we'll continue it uh, for item three, if that works for you. Well, let's see. Let's, let's play it by ear. Why don't you begin with our PCH, and then we'll see, we'll see how it flows, OK? OK. All right, very good. Good morning, uh, council members. Uh, ben Sahel with the CAO. Uh, so we are uh, just completed two months of a priority critical hiring. And in the two month pre uh, period, uh, there have been over uh, 1,000, uh, to be exact, 1,097 requests submitted, which account for uh, a lot more positions uh, than that actual request number. Because in some cases, those, a single request could entail a number of as needed or part time positions, uh, as you will see. Um, currently, of that 1,097, uh, PCH has uh, uh, over 700 and still pending for review. It has approved 192 and has denied 160. So again, as of March uh, 31st, 2024, of the 182 that have been uh, requested have been approved, uh, that has been, uh, has been comprised of 128 full-time positions. Again, as I stated, uh, over 3,946 part-time positions, most of those being with recreation and parks as they ramp up for summer, uh, summer programming at the parks. Um, and of the requests that have been denied, uh, there's 160 of those, or 154 of those are full-time positions and 28 part-time. Some of those departments that have received a, a, a higher level of, of denials have been general services department, police, and personnel. Now, I, I just want to reiterate the fact that as, as we've been working and, and meeting as a, the PCH committee, we have taken into account the positions that have been identified in the report that um, Matt will be reviewing in a short period and making sure that our request did not conflict with those positions being proposed for elimination. So that that's, uh, represents a high number of those denials, is us uh, in the PCH uh, 
acknowledging that those positions may be eliminated. So we wanted to make sure that council had the opportunity to, to you know, have that uh, weigh in on that those positions uh, that are identified for elimination before we filled and, and took away that vacancy. So um, with that said, we are still pr pr uh, proceeding to meet. We will be meeting later on this week uh, to review some of the pending items that are before us, including again, some of the, the work um, uh, in preparation of summer, the summer work at uh, recreation and parks, including summer night lights. And that concludes my presentation on the PCH. Thanks very much. So sticking with PCH for the moment, or sticking with PCH. So if we look at the table, the table one, of those uh, nearly 1,100 requests, 514 pending review by the CAO. The committee has 207, uh, denied 160, request rescinded. So that's nearly 1,000, 700. 800, about nine, a little over 900 positions. In those categories, in those categories, not saying that these are all going to be eliminated, are those 900 consistent with what we're going to hear next? It looks like we're going to go next to the item three uh, yeah. on the, your, your list of 2,000. Yeah, a good majority of the ones that have been either denied or still pending review do in fact fall into the category of of positions identified for elimination. So with, you know, because of that uh, other action taking place, I, on the, as a PCH committee member, uh, we've been holding back on, on either approving them or, or in fact just denying them because we, we didn't want to uh, fill a position that may actually end up being eliminated as part of the budget process. Yeah, so I think you just said it again, and well, I'll ask it for absolute clarity. Approved by PCH committee, that's complete through the process, 192. None of those positions would be proposed by you to be, by CIO, to be eliminated. Correct, because we assume that those will be filled if they have not been filled already. We took that into consideration when, when identifying the positions for elimination. And but clearly, we, just to, uh, again to be clear where we are in the process, if approved by PCH committee of those 192, those are, are maybe in the process of being filled, or maybe, I mean, and some may be filled tomorrow, and some may be filled over a period of time. I mean, the, the folks are prospectively coming in and saying we need these. Correct. And, and so as one of the instructions that we had as, as our analysts were looking over position and vacancies was if, if you know that there has been an approval made by PCH, do not consider that position vacant or, or do not consider that a position for the uh, elimination list. Okay. Um, colleagues, I think there's going to be a lot of questions that flow in. I, mean, I will give you a heads up that we will go to item three next and get the report on the 2000, because I think it does flow properly. Uh, but colleagues, you have questions on this? Just one, just quick question. So we have 721 pending reviews. Do we know how many positions those equate to, full-time and part-time? Full time, it's going to be close to 700, because uh, almost each individual request uh, ties to one individual full time position. But in some cases, one individual request will tie back to multiple as needed or part time uh, positions. But uh, we have gotten through our, our, um, you know, our, the queue of as needed positions, which was mostly rec and parks, early in the process. And now what we're seeing is just mostly a one for one request for one position coming through. Yes. Uh, for 700, how long do you think that takes, or what's your approximation? Well, I, I think once we, uh, uh, the air gets cleared with the position elimination you know, actions, uh, PCH will have much better guidance as to what, what's left, uh, what positions will be left, and, and what, which positions will be left next year uh, to allow for hiring to continue. So once, uh, I think we're really just waiting on what happens with the position elimination list to see you know, what, what should definitely be allowed to be filled and what should definitely not be allowed to be filled because it's gonna be you know, eliminated next year. I mean, I get your process. I'm just curious how long that'll take you. Or is this a workload that's gonna take you a month, two months, three, um, it'll summer? Probably, 
Yeah, it'll probably get us, you know, right now we're only taking actions on, on positions for the current fiscal year. So we won't know what's available to be filled until the budget for next year, until the budget gets, gets adopted and whether or not the council and the mayor are gonna want this process to continue going into next year. The PCH process. Exactly. No more further questions. Thank you. Um, we will move then to item number three. And I think before we do, because there is such an overlap, I think we can take our actions on item number three that, will, that would relate to anything here. I'm gonna move that we continue the CIO report we're going to keep bringing back PCH, especially going to your last comment that PCH may be a process that continues for some time. Uh, what we will see. Or not. So I'm going to ask for a roll call on just continuing uh, this item uh, to our uh, next available agenda. Very good. Councilmember McOsker? Yes. Councilmember Padilla? Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez? Yes. This matter is continued. Thank you. So now, item number three. Uh, Ms. Kirk, can you read it into the record, please? Yes. Item three, CL report relative to a proposal to eliminate vacant positions. This matter has also been referred to the Budget Finance and Innovation Committee. Thank you. Mr. Zabo, you're up. Okay. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I would like to spend a little bit of time because this is an extraordinary action uh, that we are recommending uh, to walk through the rationale for position elimination. Uh, how how and why uh, we are here making this recommendation, uh, some of the arguments that have been uh, raised against position elimination, and then the details of the proposal. Um, Can you go more into the mic? A little more. Sorry? Right, more into the mic. Okay, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with the uh, rationale for position elimination and the recommendations that uh, our office is making. As uh, this committee is well aware, um, we are facing a confluence of declining revenues and increased expenditures. Our, the, our current snapshot of our, uh, which we reported in the uh, mid-year financial status report, is that our revenues were down against plan uh, by 187 million, and overspending was uh, projected at uh, over, over plan by 289 million. Uh, again, the, the issues that we're facing that's requiring the city to take extraordinary action is uh, we, our uh, budget, uh, in addition to property tax, relies heavily on uh, tax revenues that are very sensitive to swings in the economy. And while we are not in a recession right now, um, the stock market is great, and that's, and that's fine, but uh, we have um, uh, endured uh, three years of high inflation. Uh, we're still not back to our, our 20 year averages. Um, in 2022, inflation was nearly 10%. Uh, it has eased, but that doesn't mean that prices are going down. And uh, three years into the spike in inflation, uh, we are seeing that having an effect on consumer behavior. And that is having a direct impact on our sales tax and on our business tax. Uh, we are seeing our uh, hotel tax, our TOT, uh, decline versus projections. And of course, uh, the high interest rates has had a uh, really uh, uh, negative impact on the housing market. It's essentially uh, frozen the housing market. And, uh, and so we're seeing our uh, documentary transfer tax come in uh, way below projections uh, as well. We expect these trends to continue in 24-25. Uh, we are expecting, and uh, as the mayor will propose her budget in uh, less than two weeks, uh, we are expecting low, uh, low to no revenue growth uh, for 24-25. Um, at the same time, uh, we are seeing uh, dramatic cost increases. Of course, the period of inflation, in addition to having a down, putting downward pressure on consumer behavior has put upward pressure on, pressure on wages. We've seen that from McDonald's to Hollywood to the school district, and uh, to, uh, the city has a, an interest in remaining a competitive employer. Um, and we have, uh, and we will be forwarding to uh, the city council uh, compensation increases that will add over the next five years uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of. Uh, obligatory expenses every year for the next five years. Thank you. Uh, 
at the same time, uh, and, and much of this, the economic conditions uh, leading to the, the budget gaps uh, is a echo of the damage that COVID did to our economy. Um, our vacancy rates, in, in a certain sense, is also an echo of what COVID did to the city. And we have been experiencing a, uh, a increase in our vacancy rates since 2020. Um, in 2020, we had about 11% vacancy rate, which is a, a, about the, the standard going back over several years. And then you see it jumps uh, to 15%, 16%, 17%, 18% in the subsequent four years. And that is largely because, uh, as a response to COVID, we stopped hiring. We also incentivized retirements, by, uh, thereby creating vacancies. And then in the recovery phase, uh, when we received the federal money, when our revenues came back, um, we attempted to restore services by adding positions on top of already uh, high vacancy rates. Uh, and so this is, we're not facing a, a hiring crisis as much as we have uh, created vacancies as response to COVID and we created vacancies by adding positions when the economy recovered. So, as of, as of now, uh, looking at our general fund, uh, we have about 3,600 positions that are vacant uh, that have an impact on the general fund of nearly $300 million. $288 million are set aside in our current year budget on positions that are not filled and are delivering no services. That $288 million represents uh, more than we spend on every library in the city in a given year. Uh, yet that money is set aside, taken out of our budget for services that will not be delivered and have not been delivered this year. Uh, so why are we recommending position elimination? First of all, it provides a structural solution to an ongoing budget imbalance. As I said uh, a few uh, slides ago, uh, we have ongoing uh, cost increases uh, as it relates to employee compensation. Uh, the uh, the revenue picture, uh, we count that as ongoing. Um, we will need a turnaround for that to be, uh, for that to uh, increase. Um, and so we do need to have a structural solution. Um, it will also have a limited impact on services. Um, again, these are vacant positions. These are not filled positions. Many of these positions have been vacant for more than two years. Some of them have never been filled at all. And uh, they are delivering no services today. And if we're looking at needing to reduce expenditures uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars moving forward, uh, the best and first place to look is the positions that aren't filled that will not trigger layoffs. Um, and third, uh, as we have, as we will show, the uh, vacancy eliminations will result in significant savings. And I, and I will just say that these savings that the uh, vacancy eliminations will generate are absolutely essential uh, to uh, balancing the budget, to bringing the city into structural balance, and in, in avoiding layoffs. Um, the uh, considerations and criteria that this office um, considered in uh, uh, developing the list uh, included the following, that um, the positions were not, uh, we did take the priority critical hiring priorities that were established by this council uh, into account. Uh, that is not to say that there are no positions uh, on the list that would fall into that category, but in terms of the degree of elimination that we're recommending, uh, we attempted to provide substantial vacancies or to, to uh, leave substantial vacancies in the priority areas identified by the council. We also work with the departments. We ask them to rank uh, their vacancies in, in terms of need and we took that into account. Uh, we took into account the, the position's role in the department's operations. We would not want to uh, decapitate a, a division by, not, by eliminating a, a division head, for example. Uh, and uh, we took a number of other factors uh, into account, including the length of time that a position 
uh, has been vacant and whether that elimination of that position or the filling of that position would have an impact on revenue if it was a revenue generating position. Um, there have been a number of um, arguments or concerns uh, raised as it relates to vacancy elimination. Uh, and first and foremost is that it would have a service impact or re at least reduce the opportunity to improve services. And uh, quite frankly, we uh, are not in a position this year uh, our budget is not going to allow us to uh, expand services, certainly not across the board. And so again, with, in looking at necessary reductions, uh, eliminating vacant positions would have a, a lower um, uh, impact on services and our, our attempt and our recommendations um, are looking at the lower priority services where we're eliminating the vacancies. We're also, again, uh, looking not to uh, trigger layoffs, and, and that's an important consideration. Um, argument two is that retaining vacant positions gives uh, departments hiring flexibility. That's absolutely true. Uh, there, are, there are many ways that departments and, uh, can uh, exercise flexibility. Uh, we say in our report there are substitute authorities, there are in-lieu authorities. We can work with the departments if there is a particular need for a particular position uh, uh, as, as we move forward after the positions are eliminated. Uh, departments have, uh, and some have said, well, it, makes, it will make it difficult for departments to add new positions. We'll have to go through the whole process over again. Uh, and again, um, uh, I, while that is true, uh, it does take a long time to add a new position. Um, we are not in a position to pay for those positions. We have to find the reduction somewhere. And the, eliminating the vacancies will allow the mayor and the council to look at, the, at city spending, to look at where we're allocating our resources, and when we can afford to do so, add back services uh, in the, the priority areas. Uh, and, and then lastly, vacancy elimination, uh, again, not, uh, not being a strategic way to reduce spending, it's uh, across the board. Again, our recommendations attempted to take the council's, uh, council established priorities uh, into account in recommending the position eliminations. It attempted to leave uh, vacancies uh, and allow departments to retain vacancies in priority areas. Um, further consideration of a uh, further priority um, would require us to consider uh, eliminating field positions. And that's, uh, that is not a conversation, that's not a recommendation that we're making at this time. Uh, but if we're looking at wanting to spend a lot more in certain areas uh, beyond uh, these, these reductions, we would need to look at uh, reducing uh, field positions. But that is not a, a conversation that, uh, and not a recommendation that we are making today. Um, very quickly on the proposal uh, that is in the report in front of you. As I said, there are about six, uh, 3,600 vacant positions, the value of 288 million. Our proposal is to eliminate uh, uh, nearly 2,000 of those, 1,974 of those positions. That would have an impact, a direct impact of 155 million dollars. There would also be significant pension savings that. Uh, would be realized with that. So the, the overall savings would, it would exceed, we believe, $200 million. Uh, and then lastly, I do want to uh, just point out, and I know that's a little bit small, but hopefully you can see it on your screen. Uh, there are some uh, position eliminations that we are recommending in the categories that this uh, committee has exempted from the priority hiring process. Uh, and, and I did just want to indicate for each of those classifications, for example, for, uh, for PSRs, for, for 911 operators, uh, we are recommending to eliminate 10 of those uh, vacancies. There are uh, 84 vacancies, um, but there are also 703 total authorities. Uh, so we're, uh, we're taking an approach to uh, limit the amount of vacancies that, uh, that we would be eliminating in those priority positions. Uh, for uh, refuse collection uh, truck operator, RCTOs, uh, 
there are 830 authorities, uh, 97 vacancies. So the department would be uh, retaining uh, the vast, vast majority of those, of those positions. Uh, and then we also provided the length of, uh, of vacancies or the average length of vacancies for these classifications. And you can see many of them have been uh, vacant for well over a year. Um, that concludes uh, my presentation. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Um, when you, uh, just to highlight a couple of things you said, when you talk about, when you alluded to eliminating positions that are filled and avoiding that, you're talking about layoffs. That is correct. Yeah. So this is, uh, so let be super clear, not a, you're not, CIO is not proposing a single layoff here. That is correct. And in fact, um, we anticipated that due to the nature of filling positions uh, and, and our recommendations that if we discovered that uh, we have recommended a position that has subsequently been filled, subsequent mm -hmm. to our recommendation, yeah. that we would work with the departments to find an alternative. Our, our intent is not to trigger any layoffs. Yeah. I, I will cut right to my sort of my, my bottom line with this before I turn it over to my colleagues for questions. One of the things we've been doing, one of the, what we've been doing with these special meetings over the last two months, and we're gonna do today, right after this, and we're gonna do in probably in two weeks and finish up you know, every department, is we're getting departments to come in, which I'm sure you've done probably more thoroughly than I have, than we have, and they're giving us their lists of here are our vacancies by category, by position. Here's the classification, here's what, here's what the job is. And most departments, and when they don't, we ask them to come back and give it to us, here is how long the position's been open. Here's the last time it was filled, which goes to, uh, probably goes to Ms. Fonseca's comment that you know, a position that's been open for a month is different than a position that's never been filled. Maybe I miscite the argument, but I would make an argument that, that that important information for us is going to be, here is the, and I'm gonna come back to another question before you do this, here's the, here are the vacant positions by category. Here is how long they've been vacant. And here is what we are proposing to eliminate. And in the absence of saying we're proposing to eliminate it, I'm going to presume that it can be filled. And that is going to be helpful information for the council, for this committee, but more importantly for budget and finance and for the city council. Uh, because and I understand why you present the information. You're presenting this in a way, and we're just going to be uh, noting and filing this, ultimately, because it's going to go into the budget process. But I want you to think about, for a moment, whether or not you can present that for us. And then I'm going to ask you a different question. I'm going to ask you an easier one. In your slides, you, t you give us the, the um, increasing vacancy rate over time and put us at about 18% now. It's probably less than that, but probably slightly less than that now. What, and you made one of, the, one of the pieces of information you gave us was that after the pandemic, we added positions. And so that leads us naturally to, it would be helpful for us to have sort of the raw number of authorized positions. How does that graph work? Uh, because a vacancy rate of 18% is important to know, but as compared to what? Are we 2,000 positions more than we were three years ago? Are we 10,000? Are we 3,000 fewer? So I'd like to see what the raw numbers are because the argument is going to come back to can we provide services after we've eliminated positions as compared to what? Mm -hmm. you know, so that's going to be important. So why don't you start with that one? Why don't you tell us about the raw numbers of position authorities and employees on board? Sure. So I, um, I, I certainly can report back with the exact numbers. Uh, we, uh, I will say, um, prior to the pandemic, uh, we were just shy of having recovered, at least on the authorities front, uh, from the Great Recession of 2008-9, where we lost about 5,000 civilian positions. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, the difference, the difference from where we are now to where we were then is as we had retirements, as we had early retirements, um, we eliminated those positions uh, immediately, took them off the books because we had to. Uh, in this, uh, in COVID, uh, in our response to COVID, we were looking to immediately save money. We didn't eliminate the positions. So we had a hiring freeze that, that created um, 
I, I, I will need to get back to you on how many uh, uh, vacancies that created because it happened at the same time that we had an early retirement, uh, excuse me, not an early retirement, a retirement incentive program that took about 1,300 uh, positions, filled positions, and created about 1,300 vacancies. Um, subsequent to that, um, so that really uh, boosted the vacancy rate from that 10% to about 15%. And then in the 22-23 budget and the 23-24 budget, um, we added a total of about uh, 2,000 new position authorities. In 2022, uh, we added about, about 12 to 1,300 new authorities uh, in the 22-23 in the budget. And then 23-24 budget, uh, just over 800 position authorities, net new positions, on top of a 15% vacancy rate. So that is that is where you see the vacancy rate you know, between uh, June of of 23 and July of 23 spikes, uh, and not because we just had an immediate um, hiring crisis, it's because we added uh, 800 positions to the books. Of course, they're they're vacant positions. Um, so I can, we can certainly provide that in detail uh, in writing so you can see that. Uh, to your first question, uh, we, can, we can certainly provide that. And, and we've been doing that analysis in terms of uh, how long um, uh, these vacancies have been, have been open. So we can provide that, uh, this committee, the budget committee, uh, however you'd like that information. I just want to add that uh, position information will be included as part of the mayor's proposed budget, which will be out in a couple weeks. So you'll see a historic uh, view of the authorized city positions uh, going back many, many years uh, that show exactly how many were added each of those years. That'll be exhibits in the proposed budget. Yeah. So what I, what I'm, I'll come back with an instruction at the end after, after more questions. But what I'm envisioning is that we put in a lot of work here and we're going to be able to take the stack of reports that everyone's worked on so hard. Uh, department by department and see vacancies and it's a snapshot in time I totally get that the vacancies in what in what position and how long they've been vacant we have your report of the 2000 which is uh, helpful for what it intended to do but less helpful because it doesn't tell us what positions and how long they've been open and we can put that along we can put the first bit of information alongside what is going to be sounds like it's going to be the budget release and just see how the Venn diagram compares. Uh, it's going to be, I think it's going to be important for this committee and more important for budget and finance committee and ultimately for the city council. But I'll turn to my colleagues for questions. Uh, council member? Yes, I do have one. I do have a few questions. I want to uh, first talk about revenues and then I just kind of want to make sure I understood everything related to your benefits and, and arguments. So when I look at the page with the 187 million on it and you're emphasizing that our business tax, sales tax, hotel tax, property tax transfers are low, I'm curious what the comparison is uh, to reach these numbers. Is this compared to last year at this exact date? And what are the date increments from which, where you're measuring it coming to the city? So what that represents, what that 180, uh, 187 represents is where we are versus plan. And by when I say plan, uh, over the course of the year, we, uh, the 23-24 budget, assumed that we would take in uh, $7.9 billion in general fund revenue. And what that $187 uh, million dollar figure represents is that by the end of January, we were uh, 187 million behind what we expected to receive by the end of January. Okay, and I'm curious. Um, the reason why I ask this is because we're in April, so technically we still have until June to potentially make up this 187 million. Yes, and and while there is nothing published on that, I can tell you we are not making up that 187 million. It's uh, it's it's not going in the right direction. Okay, and that number. Um, was estimated based on past it was past uh, assumptions or how is that number calculated sure it, yeah. well it's based on actual receipts versus what our planned receipts were for, I guess for, that's what I'm trying year. to get at how does how do you get to your planned number so our, our plan number is an estimate that we make at the beginning of the year knowing when certain receipts come into into the city. So for example, a property tax will come in in two big batches, mostly around December when the first 
you know, property tax bill is due, and then again in April when the second one is, is due. You know, we do get some property re tax receipts coming in, in in other months, but those are the two big, big batches of, of property receipts. As opposed to sales tax, which comes in on a quarterly basis, and that's coming in from the state. Uh, so we have, you know, actual receipts to show for, but we also then forecast what we expect to get based on where the trends are. Um, other receipts come at various different times, uh, but business tax being one of the big ones of the, of the city doesn't start really coming in, doesn't start really coming into the city until around, uh, because it's not due until January. So January is, is a slow month, but then it starts picking up in February and March. But, you know, based on what we're seeing, um, we're not seeing a big uptick in, in those receipts that, that were, gives us any confidence that we're gonna make up and catch up to what the proposed budget um, has indicated we should be receiving. Okay, and then um, the last time this committee met, we, you know, similar to how we're about to jump into having the different departments tell us about their PCH um, requests, we had the Office of Finance talk about um, how the positions that they're advocating for and the future of their team is to figure out ways to better be able to bring, to collect. So I'm curious how, how much the conversations are with them, with your office, so that they can bring in um, and have the proper tools to bring in more funding into the city. I mean, th that's, that's a, an, an annual conversation that we have with the Office of Finance. Uh, we know, uh, we're very familiar with, with their work and the positions that are needed to collect funds. Um, uh, and, and I think this year, what some of the troubles have been around the systems that we have in place. Yes, and systems so that, and software, right? Yeah, and so there have been appropriations made in, in past budgets in this budget, and I think there's a request going into next fiscal year to help with the transition of their system into a uh, uh, cloud-based uh, system, uh, but also just some upgrades to their collection software. So those, I mean, we do definitely see a need for those because uh, we're feeling the impact now. We're not getting the best data coming out of the system as, as we speak, but um, you know, that's gonna be part of the, the, the various priority areas that, that the mayor and the council will have to determine as to what, what gets funded. Perfect, I think that's a good transition into sort of my next question and comments. Um, when I read your benefits here, that we definitely need a structural solution this would cause significant savings um, and not have an impact on services. When I look at your arguments, I see where it's like flexibility, restructure, and be strategic. So my question is, or observation is, to be strategic and to really, uh, is this proposal to eliminate the positions, the opportunity so that we can be strategic and restructure and have more productive conversations related to the sort of positions that we have to make sure our departments have so that we can start to bring in and see the better revenue and continue to see um, and have the ability to really as a full city think through what positions need to cover such different tasks? Yes, uh, council member, it really is. And it's and it's not, uh, I'm not looking at this as a, as a benefit, but the, um, the reason for this proposal is because we we need to make expenditure reductions. We could only we could only provide what we can pay for, uh, so we we do have to make uh, significant expenditure reductions. Eliminating the vacant positions will uh, will provide uh, essentially a, a reset, and will allow this this body and the mayor to then take that strategic approach for where you would want to add when the economy and when our revenues will allow us to do so. Further discussion. Now, some have argued that, well, you know, we should be focusing more on, on some areas and less on others, and and that is a conversation that that we can certainly have. But that would also need to be within the context of being willing to uh, to reduce or eliminate filled positions, um, and and that is where we we um, we drew the line. So this uh, this will reset the our, our position allocation to where we were a few years ago, uh, and, and it will allow this body, when we can afford it, we will not be able to afford it this year. When we can afford it, it will allow us to add, add back in, in the priority areas. Okay, I, I, I bring this up because when I see, I can almost see your long-term kind of vision of what you're trying to accomplish here, 
which is that we have better numbers to work with, realistic numbers, by uh, eliminating what departments are utilizing for cost savings um, so that we can restructure. But I just want to make sure that in this conversation, we remember what our bottom line is in terms of what we have to bring back to our districts. So for example, with me, my constituents won't pay. They won't hoot for joy if I pass some incredibly amazing, innovative, progressive policy if their streets are a mess. So I have to make sure that I keep their streets clean and their neighborhoods clean um, and that everything related to making sure that that happens is funded. But if we also have to make sure that we prioritize offices saying we can't collect the revenue because our tools and our staffing isn't um, properly uh, structured, then that's a problem. So this is just my way of saying that I hope that in this process, we really can um, have a holistic conversation about what flexibility, restructuring, and strategy means. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member. Cool. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, well, first of all, I want to uh, sort of praise you for, you know, dealing with all this. Uh, I, I know it's not an easy thing, but I do appreciate the level of detail that you've presented this today, um, and especially the, the rationale for position elimination or elimination of the vacancies. Um, I think there's six very com important competing things that you've presented, and I think they all sort of work in tandem in, in trying to make a decision. Um, I do have a question about the, the length of the position being vacant. Is there, can you give sort of a general sense of what you think that cutoff time is? Um, like what, what differentiates one that you should eliminate vacancy as opposed to not? Well, I don't, I don't think, and th that's where the council priorities come into, uh, come into play. I, 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 we would not be, and, and we didn't include it in the report in part because uh, we were a, a attempting to, A, hit a number, we, we needed to generate savings, uh, and B, try to reflect the priorities set by the, by the council and the mayor. Um, and, so, and so the length of vacancy um, uh, was, a, was a, a kind of a lower tier consideration. Uh, but if clearly if a position was added and, and uh, you know, the way that we've looked at these, we've, um, uh, we'll, we'll be able to, to give you, if it's how many months it's been vacant, um, up to two years. And if it's been vacant for over two years, I think that, that is a pretty compelling story that it might not be a, a, critical, a critical position. Um, certainly if it's been vacant for over a year, um, but some of these positions have been vacant for uh, in excess of 23 months. Um, so again, that would be up to you to make that determination, whether the length, how the length of vacancy plays into uh, priorities that you'd set for service delivery. So it really, there wasn't one general guiding principle. It sounds like it was dependent on the position and other factors as well. We, we took a number of factors into consideration understanding that, that we, we needed to present a, a, a significant reduction in authorized positions. Okay. All right, let me jump to department's ranked need. Um, it, 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 please explain to me the, the, the process you had with the, the general managers or the AGMs like in this area here. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so I'm looking at the six different rationale for position vacancy elimination, and we just talked about length of time, but I want to jump over to department's ranked need. We, we, what we did is we, we offered the departments, um, you know, we, this is a difficult decision. We're, with the report is trying to be as transparent as possible with providing as much detail on the services. We also work with the departments clearly. I've personally been working with the departments on a weekly basis, the department heads on a weekly basis. Um, we asked them to uh, rank. Uh, we provided them our list of vacancies as we saw them. We wanted that we asked them to, to validate that those are positions that were actually vacant, number one. And then number two, we asked them to rank the vacancies in terms of priorities into three tiers. The top tier, absolutely critical, we need to retain. Second tier, mid. And third, you could probably take. Um, and, and we got uh, mixed. 
uh, mixed responses um, in, in some departments. Every vacancy was uh, critical, uh, and, and so in those cases, we needed to uh, use our best judgment to make a recommendation um, using the, uh, uh, the considerations that, that are in the report. Yeah. Um, so, so there, it sounds like there were situations that there wasn't a agreement on the way both, both parties saw what needed to be done. And you had to make the judgment. It sounds like you had to make, the CEO had to make the judgment call at the end. Correct. Which is, uh, that happens, that happens all the time. <laughs> sounds a little, that's a little frustrating for me to hear because mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I mean, look, from, from my background, there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of pushing, a lot of debate, you know, and it's okay. We, I, I enjoy sort of getting into the fray of things and trying to figure things out. You miss, the, the chair here knows how, how much we care for each other, but at the end of the day, we, we sometimes have disagreements, but we always sort of reach a consensus, right? It, how, how, would you say that was more common in this process, or what was more common, this sort of jumping into the fray, getting to a consensus, or? you sort of walked away with disagreements and then you had to make a decision. Well, we, we had, you know, certainly there's, uh, we're, on, we're on deadlines. And so we certainly established deadlines and, and asked for feedback and did the best that we could to accommodate the department's uh, setting of priorities. And certainly if the department, uh, if the, you know, we gave each department a target and it was a different target for each department. Um, our goal was to get down to um, uh, a fairly consistent, uh, a fairly consistent vacancy rate um, that would be roughly uh, represented with a, with a 5% uh, salary savings, uh, that would remain a 5% salary savings rate. So uh, some departments that had more vacancies, we recommended taking more. Uh, to the extent that they were able to give us recommendations that met their target, um, we were we were happy to take them, and there was there was consensus. Of course, no one was happy about it, but uh, there was consensus that if we have to do this, this is the way to do it. In some cases, departments failed to, to give us the uh, to to meet the target, and so we uh, we had to make uh, our our best judgment for for a recommendation moving forward. I see. Um, okay, that. Uh I know we're on deadlines and, and we're trying to move as quickly as, as we can. I, I, I hate to be in a position where, I, I think it, from my experience when a, a process like that happens and there isn't a consensus reached through dialogue and discussion, what's gonna happen, what I fear is gonna happen is, you know, six months, seven months from now, when you know we start getting calls about you know X Y Z, we're going to go to the departments, and the departments are going to be like, well, we didn't agree to this, you know, like, you know, uh, and 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 that that might be the culture at City Hall. I, I don't know. I don't agree with that culture, but uh, it, I, I hate to be in that position. Uh, I think it's always good to be, even if it takes a little longer, that both parties come in, or sometimes it doesn't take longer. I think both parties need to come in willingly knowing where the, the line needs to be met and struggle to that until you get to that certain line. Um, but in, in that sort of same vein, was there ever a situation where uh, perhaps, you know, you said this is where we need to get and then allowed the department heads to rearrange their departments so that they could meet that need? 100%, in, in every case, that, that, that's our preference. We'll, we gave them uh, the option to do that. In some cases, we did get feedback and we did make changes based on the department's feedback. Um, we are, you know, and when I, when I say there, there are deadlines, they're not arbitrary deadlines, of course, the budget is due uh, on the 20th of April, and uh, the budget uh, uh, will heavily rely, the mayor's proposed budget will heavily rely on required expenditure reductions in order to balance, uh, and, and we needed, to, we had to do the work in a timely manner, um, but certainly we, um, we encourage the departments to, uh, if they felt like um, they wanted to submit an alternative list of positions to be uh, vacant positions for elimination, uh, we were very, very open to that. Uh, provided, of course, that it was a it was a legitimate list that um, provided the same amount of savings, and it didn't rely on they weren't one-time savings, and it didn't rely on uh, some future idea that there might be revenue coming in that that uh, that we couldn't validate. 
Um, but if it was actual savings that met their target, we were very happy to take the department's recommendation. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much for allowing me a little sneak peek into and sort of the, the interactions that happen with the departments. Uh, and I, I want to sort of echo what uh, some of my colleagues said here is, you know, it's, it, we're in the situation, it's a tough situation, but I think most, uh, I think most of the council members, if not all of us, are going to be really thinking about you know, what are, the, what are the calls that we get? What are constituents complaining about? What are the services, right? And that really falls into, you know, six or seven departments. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that those are, you know, valued more in the city. Uh, I, you know, we've, I, we value all, I value all the departments that are here. It's just when times are, when you're in this situation, you have to make, unfortunately, tough decisions, right? And the things that, our constituents are going to demand more is again unfortunately falls in six or seven departments but I think whether wherever we end up I want to walk away knowing that there was a interactive process where there was back and forth and wherever possible that there was a consensus reached with those departments uh, th that didn't happen uh, with all of them um, you know it's just I guess we can charge it to the game but I do want to go back and make my own sort of have personal meetings with some of those departments because again I don't want to be here six seven months down the line and say you know we tried to get that and, and we did it I, I think we still have an opportunity to try to at least not right the ship but at least move it in a slightly different direction but again I appreciate everything you're doing I know this is not easy we're in a time crunch and um, yeah thank you again for, for everything you're doing thank you thank you colleagues um, I'm gonna make a an extra statement uh, and you can agree or disagree with me, and then I'm, I'm going to make a give a direction for what what we want to move and have come back. I think it's really important for us to note that should we eliminate positions, whether it's one position or two thousand positions, it is really just a it, it, while it's real for those departments, it also puts us inextricably on a course where we are going to spend less on something. Why do I say that? Because Today, let's say we have Department A. I won't pick a department to pick on them. Let's say we have 100 positions in Department A, and we put $100 in to pay for those positions, and they have 70 of them filled. At the end of the year, those 30 bucks go somewhere. It doesn't come back. Our reserve fund would be, would be $200 million a year bigger if this was as simple as just eliminating positions. That money goes somewhere and presumably goes to something that we all care about because that money goes somewhere. And so the reality is, is that this is important. It is important to make sure that we are funding our departments in a way that is rational and sustainable and structurally sound, but it's not as simple as just eliminating positions. In the end, something else, something else gets eliminated because that money that otherwise goes into a department year after year, or departments year after year after year that is over and above what their headcount is, actually gets spent on sidewalk streets, curbs, gutters, stuff. Correct or not correct? I agree with that. And, and in the 23-24 budget, you know, so it does, the, the unspent uh, salary dollars do revert to the reserve fund, as you, as you stated. And, and that is in part why our reserve fund has been so robust over the past two years. Um, in the 23-24 budget, it was facilitated, the spending plan was facilitated by $135 million of excess reserves that could be, um, that could be traced back to those vacancies. So yes, that is true. But um, again, the uh, bigger picture, the, the big picture, is that we could only uh, afford to provide what, uh, what we take in. We have to align expenditures with revenues, and uh, both are going in the wrong direction. So eyes wide open, this is going to be even more painful than eliminating positions that we haven't filled. It will be once we go down this path. But we are, that is a, this is a discussion that will continue here. More importantly, we'll continue in budget and finance, and most importantly, on, on the city council. Everything you've given us is, I want to be really super clear, it's just a recommendation. And the document we get on the 20th is just a recommendation. We 
we will take action on all those. And given what my colleagues said so insightfully about making sure our streets are clean and understanding you know, what happened in each department, what I am going to do is ask that we continue this item and not note and file it, but continue it because we're going to have one more special paw. And um, what I'm going to ask for is that you come back with, um, as we discussed at the outset, a table, and it can be a document that's derived from the budget. In fact, that would be helpful if it's derived from the proposed budget. Proposed budget. And that would be a table that tells us what are the positions proposed to be eliminated by department and by classification, and then how long that, because it is an important piece for us, how long that position has been open, when was the last time it was filled. And I'll give an example. If we have an apart a department that's contributing a whole bunch of positions, but they are all at you know, Gardner, Gardner um, you know, groundskeeper, that means something to us as council members. That doesn't just mean a chunk of money. That means something. And so we had, need to see what the positions are and whether or not we're, we are doing this in a way where you all came to an agreement across the table or whether it just happened because that was the only thing that was given up. I editorialized too much in my direction. But what I'm asking for is a continuance and that we come back with that table. Is that clear, Mr. Clerk? Very. I'll call the roll. Okay, Councilmember Oscar. Yes. Uh, Councilmember Park. Park. Or Padilla, excuse me. Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Very good. Thank you. That passes. And thank you so much for all this work. We are all aware that that these deadlines are real, and that you put together a great deal of work. And asking for more information is no indication that we think it was insufficient. It's just we are focused now on the next step. Okay. Okay. Understood. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, members. We will then move to item one. Item take, number one. Is, yes. If you can read that into the record, we'll yep. take uh, housing department first. Okay. Item number one is continue from March 27, 2024. Communication and or verbal updates from departments in response to motion. McOsker, Kikorian, Harris, Dawson. Relative to requesting all city departments provide a list of each vacant employee position to the CAO, personnel department, and city council. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Um, so housing first. I appreciate... Um, Everybody sitting through this, but I hope it's this is all very instructive as, as we head towards budget. So, if you could identify yourself and give us a brief overview of your report, I'm sure we have questions. Good morning, uh, Trisha Keen, Executive Officer for the Housing Department, and I am here with Luz Santiago, our AGM over our Administration Bureau and our Personnel Staff. Um, I will uh, go through a quick summary of the report that's before you today. Um, LAHD has a total of 762 authorized positions, one of which is being held for a sub-authority. Um, we are able to confirm just this week that an additional 14 positions were allocated last month, though they're still pending addition in workday. Um, it's important to note those 14 positions were approved by Council in November of 2023 for implementation of the Tenant Anti-Harassment Ordinance and Right to Council. Um, so they are ones that we are eager to um, have on our books and be able to actually utilize for that important work. With those pending approved positions, we have 776 authorized positions in the department. As of the beginning of April, LAHD had a 12.7% vacancy rate. That equals 96 out of our 762 positions. Again, one is um, held for a sub-authority um, that are vacant. Taking into consideration our required salary savings rate of 3%, which equals 23 positions, um, our actual functional vacancy rate is 9.7%. If you include the 14, it goes down slightly um, to just below 9.5%, um, which means we've met our salary saving rates throughout the fiscal year. Um, and I can give you a quick breakdown of the sort of category of our vacancies. Um, eight of those positions have been vacant, I think, to a question that you were discussing a minute ago. Eight of those positions have been vacant for two years or more. The remainder of the positions have been vacant either in late 23 or even some in 24. Um, 63 of those vacancies are regular positions with 33 resolution positions. Um, also important for our department in particular, and something I'll touch on in a second again, is 80% of our vacant positions are 100% special funded. Um, those recently added 14 positions, also 100% special funded. And something we like to note, 21% or 20 positions 
of those vacancies are eligible for TLH or Bridge to Jobs hiring, which, is a prog which are both programs that we've had incredible success with. Um, quickly to walk through the positions that are proposed for elimination, um, that, that includes 27 of our vacancies. Um, and we certainly welcome any opportunity for further discussion on specifically which 27 of those um, may end up needing to be eliminated. Um, I think there's always a uh, you know, wish for additional time to get into the details of those specific positions, especially because you know, we will address things like there's five of them that have people acting in those roles, so they're not truly vacant. So we'd like to preserve those positions and then work through a couple other scenarios that might result in um, us being a better able to perform some of the key programs that we need to perform while swapping out um, vacancies. But again, with few exceptions, the positions that are proposed for deletion or any of our vacancies, honestly, are primarily or completely special funded. And we are one of those departments where the majority of our positions truly are necessary to address the housing crisis and some of the work that we deal with to address homelessness-related issues. Um, our positions are a bit different in how they're funded. We recognize that. Um, they are often dedicated to specific housing priorities set by council. But I do want to stress that the housing department understands we all have a role to play in addressing a budget deficit. So we're absolutely happy to do our part. Of course, we, like probably every other department, would just ask for some flexibility, on ongoing flexibility, and how to make that happen. Um, with that, I will wrap up, and we are here to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks very much. I mean, because now these are all converging together, I was just looking real quick on your PCH process. And so you had submitted 49. Most of them are pending. Uh, but you actually rescinded or withdrew five of those. Was that because you had an expectation that those were the rare positions that are uh, possibly not critically needed? I think, um, and I will certainly ask uh, Luce if she has any additional information or our, our personnel liaisons. Um, but I think what we tried to do very specifically with our initial round of PCH requests was mm -hmm. mostly addressing positions where we had incumbent candidates who were in positions to be promoted in place, who were receiving certs or opportunities from other departments. And we wanted to be able to first retain critical staff in the department who were already trained in doing the work. Um, and so we were, we were making sure to focus our requests on that, knowing that there's no way we we're going to get all of the PCH requests mm -hmm. approved initially or in one go round. So we wanted to be as thoughtful as possible on the ones that we truly needed, not suggesting that any of the other ones weren't necessary. They, we just weren't losing those employees. You were employees. strategically doing a retention plan? Yes. Okay. Good. Anyone to add to that? I mean, we, I think it would be fair for you and we uh, in all the committees of the council to focus particularly on specially funded positions. I mean, we, this really is a, uh, an ex this is ultimately an exercise to look to general fund. Uh, I don't have any additional questions for you, colleagues. Colleagues? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. I want to make sure I heard you right. Did I hear you say that majority, if not all of your vacancies are special funded? Um, and have been open for more than two years. Did I hear that right? So the, it is correct that the majority of our positions are special funded. Um, most of them primarily or entirely special funded. Um, the part where I'll offer some clarification is that only eight of our vacancies have been actually vacant for two years or more. Oh, okay, okay, only eight of them. Um, so my next sure. question is, sure. where is your obstacle to fill? The, for many of our vacancies, the challenges have resulted or have been surrounding similar issues you hear from other departments, lack of active hiring lists, um, the time it takes to re extend offers, especially to candidates who might be new to the city where we are competing with perhaps the private sector and the you know, time sensitivities those particular candidates might have and how long it would take to get their position approved and start with the city. Um, but for most of it is lack of active hiring lists. Thank you. No further questions. Colleague? Yes, uh, thank you so much. So uh, how was your interaction with the CAO? Do you feel like you walked away with a consensus and understanding and, uh, you know, on the same page? 
So we very much understand time sensitivities and the fact that there are real deadlines, particularly around exercises that affect the budget that comes out. Um, I do think that we would um, certainly have a, you know, we always appreciate more opportunity for discussion on this issue. And I think do recognize that, you know, while every department likes to think that they are the most special department, because our Funding sources, you know, we have 45 different funding sources and the majority of our positions you know, do not draw from the special or from the general fund. Discussions around how to balance um, target cost savings for us, we feel can be handled a little bit differently and that's, you know, that is outside of the process that the CAO is going through holistically. So certainly we'd welcome the opportunity for additional discussion on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to, um, continue this item and it'll come back when we do a roll up I think in two weeks. Thank, Thank you very much. appreciate Thank you. it. Uh, so uh, I think that we are going to go a little bit out of order and we'll take uh, Bureau of Engineering right now and then we'll go to the board. A little trick of the trade guys if you say you have to leave for another meeting you move up on the agenda. I found that out. <laughs> when, I, when, you're, when you have these big events where a bunch of elected officials are all in line to speak and all talk about themselves, if you just tell the, if you tell the moderator you have to leave for something, they call you up early. <laughs> so Ted figured that out. Go ahead. I really appreciate it, though. Thank you. We have our annual alumni lunch with retired managers come in to visit once a year, so, and I'm the host of it, as you can imagine. Not so. required to say why, by the way, because then we'll have to okay. judge you. <laughs> we'll judge you on whether it was really important, but go ahead. <laughs> It is important. Um, okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, first, a few statistics. We have 981 authorized positions in the Bureau of Engineering, 187 vacancies, which about 19%. I, I want to point out, though, that only 44 of those are entry-level positions, as pointed out in our report, which is only 4%. And it's important to note because it's often talked about like, oh, these vacancies, you know, the vacancy rate has been this much, they must not need the positions, but it's kind of like a game of musical chairs and, and the music stopped playing at the time this report was printed. But, you know, we're constantly filling positions, but anytime you fill a promotional position, it creates a new vacancy either in your department or another department. So. So for us, I know different departments are different, but for us, entry level hasn't been the difficulty. It's just working through all of those, you know, people retiring and whatnot, and then filling those vac the vacancies all the way down. And oftentimes, you know, steps along the way, one of the class doesn't have uh, a civil service exam. Of, uh, of, there's no candidates on the list, so you have to wait and things like that. So there's a lot of stories, but uh, as stated in our report at the time, this came, um, you know, the PCH process were started. We were in the late stages of hiring, uh, filling almost 61, I think it was 61 of those, yeah. And, and it, basically we're always in the process of filling all of them, but there's just some don't have lists or, or um, different other reasons. As far as salary savings, it is addressed in our report. Mm -hmm. For all the reasons mentioned, we actually don't usually need to hold that many vacancies, manually hold them for salary savings rate because there's this natural process of filling this one and this one becomes vacant. And so we have a, a tool, a dashboarding tool using Power BI for those that are familiar that tracks our different funding sources and where we're at and projects where it will be. And so we manually hold for salary savings if there's not if there's not a comfort level that we would be within our budget in that tool. Otherwise, we, we just try to fill everything and just the natural um, process of that ends up in having some savings and so we're usually able to meet it that way. Um, as pointed out in the report, we had about 20 positions held manually at the start of the fiscal year until we started progressing through and had a comfort level and we had released all of those and we're in the process of filling all of them. Um, I've, I wasn't sure if this committee was interested in some suggestions related to PCH or not. I, I put them in just, and I want to touch sure. on them a little bit. Good. Um, with regard to assistant general manager and division manager positions, as Matt uh, mentioned, you know, it, you can't decapitate a division. So somebody has to run a division when you have a, a you know, a division doing a certain function. Mm -hmm. So for us, we think it would be much more efficient if those positions uh, 
did not need to go through the PCH process, if they could just be administratively approved by the CAO analyst, verifying that, yeah, this is a division manager position, because essentially, otherwise, somebody's going to be doing that function, but they just won't be getting paid for it if they're, you know, having to run the division, but we're not able to formally fill the position. Similarly, with our sidewalk repair program, and I, I think all of you are familiar with the Willits settlement and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, allowing for those to be administratively approved for, by the CAO analysts would be very helpful. And similarly, uh, positions related to the homeless project, uh, homeless facilities projects. And then we did also put in a suggestion that positions that are fully special funded that don't have a general fund impact it would be worth considering allowing the CAO analysts to be able to administratively approve those to free up, uh, you know, there's quite a lot that will be on the PCH agenda. And some of this depends on the way things go. Uh, as Matt and Ben mentioned, maybe, um, maybe the PCH process doesn't go on a long time, then, then these things aren't really a big deal. But if the PCH process is yeah. to go on, we still haven't had a single uh, position make it to their agendas. And it's you know, I definitely um, skipped past the paragraph, but we definitely uh, agree with the need to cut positions and to live within the city's budget. We're not going to argue against cutting positions. We do uh, see this as a starting point, the CAO list. Honestly, I think, you know, they've done their best to work in their strategic priorities, as they mentioned. but. Yeah it's impossible for them to really know the inner workings of every department and what would be best. And so from their standpoint, not wanting to cut filled positions because you know that may result in layoffs, but at the departmental level, we know, well, maybe it would be better to cut this position and move the person somewhere else. It doesn't always mean a layoff to fill a cut position, uh, yeah. to cut a filled position. And so we just see that, you know, there's not much time. They, they really almost have to finalize the proposed budget with the mayor in the coming days. The, the deadline is coming very soon, so we understand they need to use that as a starting point. And then, but we see, you know, that the next step would be working with council and through the budget process to maybe propose alternatives to fine tune some of that. Yeah. But we're fully on board with the need to live within the economic means, but to, to the extent that we can streamline these other things, okay, make decisions quickly. Are we going to be allowed to fill it or not fill it? But when we can fill it, get the decision made quickly because, you know, managing in these times of less resources is even more challenging. So yeah. to the extent we cannot add additional um, burdens on top of filling positions that will be allowed, that, that would be very helpful. Got it. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, everything you just said, and, and thank you for the PCH comments. We will keep that on our agenda as so a separate item, but I really just want to focus on you, your comments and the single line that we get on the list of 2,000 illustrates why it's important to know what these positions are. You have 961, according to the CAO, uh, positions, according to the CAO, you have 178 open, although I think you said 180 plus. Mm -hmm. uh, they are proposing a cut of 78, which would leave you 100 positions. But that's helpful information to know that you have a very low vacancy rate at the entry level, and so these are positions cut uh, in your, presumably in your chain of management and division heads. That's why, exactly why we need to know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I appreciate all of your comments. I really don't have a question for you because it's unpacking what I just said is going to be most important to me. Colleague? Um, yeah, it's a little random, but I'm still curious. Um, it sounds like you kind of figured out your own accounting and structure uh, to work with the resources that are allocated to you. So I'm curious, you mentioned a dashboard, and I'm curious if this is the sort of tool that maybe should be part of this uh, new wave of knowledge sharing conversation that's finally taking place in this building and seeing if maybe this tool that you have at your disposal could help everyone else get to that point. Yeah, we're definitely happy to share it with anyone that's interested to see it. You know, it's What's it called? Well, it's just a Power, so it's a Power BI database, so it uses some data that we have internally that others would have to figure out how to have their own, but it's kind of like, it uses position data and then financial data from FMS. So we just call it our salary analysis tool, but we, 
we had a need to create it. Uh, we started years ago, honestly. It, it's, it was quite an effort to create it because we have about 40 funding sources, or we'll call them pseudo-funding sources. It's a mix of both. The Bureau of Engineering does a lot of projects, and so we have a lot of different funding sources. Sometimes, like general fund, we may break it into about five different buckets of, in that tool. For example, general fund development services separate from regular general fund because they each have their own internal targets. But the reason we needed to do it is because if any special fund goes over its allotted appropriation, You're in trouble. only the general fund can make that up. Okay. So we have to track wastewater, which we usually do fine, but all these different transportation-related special funds, bridge, different things like that. Because if bridge goes over, we can't use wastewater money to make it up. That would be illegal. So, so we have to track every individual fund source, our expenditures versus our appropriation. And then anything that those are projecting to go over gets projected onto the general fund. And so that's what we're looking at throughout the year as we monitor our salaries. So, um, so it's not a vendor that gave you or handed over this tool to you. It sounds like it was designed internally. So who'd you place on it to build it? Is it your engineers, your coders, your GIS? Tell me a little bit about how you built it. Initially, I started it when I was the deputy city engineer. For those that don't know, I'm kind of a data geek, so a lot do know it, which is why you're here laughing. But, um, you know, in recent years, we have a data analyst we were able to get through the budget a few years ago. So we do have one data analyst now, and he's taken it over. And honestly, one of our programmer analysts before that did a lot of the work. So I got it started. They have continued to maintain it, and uh, it's, it's worked well. Thank you. No further questions. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Go, right. yeah, uh, we are going to continue this item as we roll them all up. Go tell the alumni we appreciate their Thank you. support. <laughs> uh, Board of Public Works. I realize we've gone long. I really appreciate everyone being here. And this is very helpful to us. So thank you. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Good morning. Good morning, council members. It's an honor to be here. Uh, even though I went after Ted, so I'll talk to him later. <laughs> uh, I'm Aura Garcia. I'm the president of the Board of Public Works, and I have our acting EO, TJ Knight, and Raul Mendoza, who is currently with us on a temporary basis, assisting us in all matters, uh, but mostly in our budget process at this time. Uh, that kind of leads us into why, um, what we were in the middle of until this process began. So the Board of Public Works is the overall, uh, the centralized body for the bureaus. You will hear about the four bureaus behind uh, mm -hmm. after me, but we at the board have 127 position authorities. As of today, we have 22 vacancies. Okay. The way we divided our positions for this report was strictly on a budgetary standpoint. The first category is fully special funded positions. These positions are mostly in our accounting department. Uh -huh. The second category is those that are partially generally funded and or special funds that are subsidized by the general fund. The category includes our executive officer position, which was recently vacated and provides a day-to-day -day oversight to the Board of Public Works. So at that time, at this time, we're looking to, uh, to see how we can best place that position back and backfill that position so that it makes sense with the new structure that we're, putting, that we're moving forward. Uh, it also includes a senior management analyst, which makes up the board's budget and admin function of our offices. I might add that that position was just recently vacated less than a month ago, and, um, and it was denied in our budget, so in our PCH process. So okay. I, I just wanted to give that slight comment. It also includes an executive administrative assistant. We have three authorities to support five commissioners. As we look to fill this gap, we want to make sure that we can do so in a way that aligns with the classification and not work anyone out of class. So as of right now, we have two assistants EA, and actually one of our EA is getting promoted at the end of this month, so we would have two vacancies in that area. Okay. And the final, final category is those that are 100% general fund. One position in particular would work on key policy priorities, and that position is a deputy petroleum administrator office. Uh, important position for Erica as she is uh, now very low staff and she needs this position as well. 
Um, second is two public works trust fund positions, accounting positions that are critical in bringing significant general fund revenue to the city. Those are important positions to us. And lastly, I'll close with the efforts that we've made in making more timely payments to our community-based organizations. We have two, two authorities for that that are currently on the uh, denial block and we would want to see at least we can save one of those community-based organization accountants. Uh, we were we were able to fill one of the two since given the authority. One uh, unfortunately then took another position somewhere else and so we had a vacancy but nevertheless we want to continue to have the authority to be able to hire somebody in that position given that now our community-based organization contractor services is up to 30 million dollars. And um, and lastly, just want to say that we are very much uh, happy to be part of the process and be able to work with our CEO's office and everybody to make sure that we do the best that we can. We really look forward on maximizing all of our resources always and making sure that we see every corner to that and that we are aligned with what the city is requesting from us. But there are some certain positions that we want to make sure that we keep in hand. So thank you for your time and we're here to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, so in the, in the CIO's 2000 report, list of 2000, looks like uh, of the, they, they believed at that time it was 20 vacant positions. Your report's a little different, and I realize those, that moves. They proposed eliminating nine positions and leaving uh, 11 open positions. Um, I'll ask two questions at once. Can you tell me a little bit about those nine? And in your report, in your narrative, you say that you have these specially funded positions and you put in parentheses, healthy specially funded. Does that mean that sometimes they're unhealthy and, and we're not able to cover with the special funds? No, 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 we're always able to cover uh, the, the position. I, did I say healthy? I think so. <laughs> uh, it's a fun I, adjective. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Funded by healthy special funds, and it, which is good. I mean, I, I, I thought maybe we're getting the signal that, um, uh, that when they are, when the fund is healthy. No, no, no. We, we, it's a healthy fund uh, overall. You're saying it is. You know, yeah, it, it definitely okay. is. Then, and hence why we, uh, we definitely need those accountants to be on hand so that we can continue to have a healthy fund in those in those positions. Okay. Uh, so, out of the nine positions, we are we we understand, and actually, we are very happy with the nine out of the other positions. However, we would want to have an opportunity to switch around some of the the ones that were denied to some of the ones that did not. So That's we will. Exactly why we want us to know what the classifications are. Okay, good. Well, so we'll have that report come back at the same time that the budget comes out. We'll be able to put them side by side with the report you gave us with what classifications they're proposing, and then you'll be able to give us proposals in case there's substitute authorities or moving them around. Perfect. Thank you. I just want to have, we want to have the opportunity to uh, prioritize ourselves, the ones that are, that have returned back as a denial because I think we can make other things happen, but we just want to make sure that we, we have that say at the end. Great. Colleague? No questions. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Next up is Conad. Come on up. Thank you so much. If you could just give us a brief overview of the report you've given us. Get a sense of where we're going to go with some of these questions. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, John Rima, your inspector of public works, director of the Bureau of Contract Administration. To my right is a gentleman who's already been sitting here, um, becoming very comfortable with this seat. Uh, our AGM, uh, Ro Mendoza, and to my left, our chief management analyst, Angelica Samoya. You um, do have our report. Uh, I yeah. will be brief. 406 authorized positions, 308 of them are regular authority, 98 are resolution authority. Um, of Since the beginning of March, 54 positions were vacant, roughly 13% vacancy rate. Um, and we have a salary savings rate of 5%, which is roughly 28 inspection positions. Um, in our report, we broke down the vacancies based on uh, revenue. And uh, just a side note, our, our approach at BCA has been to run our organization as if we were a private standalone uh, entity. And we so recognize the importance of minimizing, if not when possible, eliminating any reliance on the general fund. Uh, of those 54 
positions that are vacant, 43 of them, one could argue, mm -hmm. have little if any reliance on the general fund. And I say it in this light. Uh, be it a special fund or a uh, funding source that relates to a proprietary, uh, 23 of those positions are in that category. The other 21 positions are inspector positions that provide services to the public where when we are allowed, um, our costs are fully covered. And when I say that, I'm referring to both direct and indirect costs. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, with respect to the 23 of the 54, not only the, are the cost of the inspectors covered, indirect and direct, but we also contribute to city services. So we yeah. are actually adding to the general fund challenge. I totally get that we are, as a city, in a difficult spot. And the CAO, they've been doing everything they can to come up with a number. Um, anticipating the question, did we have discussions with the CAO? Yes, yes we did. Um, did we have discussions after the list came out? No, we didn't. But what we were always told was, if you can come up with a number that can meet this, then we would be willing to have that discussion. For us, that's gonna be a little challenging. Uh, and I say that in this light, because the majority of the positions that are listed here as vacant are positions that bring revenue into the city. Um, they're not going to be relying on the general fund. Now, let me be real specific here. Is there a front funding from the general fund? Yes, there is. I totally get that. But at the end of the day, when we're closing out a fiscal year, when these positions are filled and these men or women are working in the positions identified, then we are zeroing out plus adding to the general fund. So in that regard, there is a zero sum, no reliance at all. Um, I've been listening to some of the conversations with respect to how long positions have been vacant. Dare I speak for other departments, but I really don't think that's something that we should give any consideration to. I say that personally, and I say that in this light. As general managers, we make decisions as to how we're gonna run our organization. And for us, our decision was we wanted to make sure that we fill those positions that would directly impact the services that we deliver, be it inspection on one side or compliance on the other side. Wage theft is something that many have been concerned about. So over the last two years, we've hired over 43 analysts dealing directly with that issue. We've even gone so far as to create a new position called special investigator because we recognize that was critically important. No disrespect to overhead positions in our executive team, but the base for us was critically important. On the inspection side, which you will see, the majority of our vacancies are inspectors. Why are so many vacant? Quite frankly, because we could not find individuals. The, the industry right now is suffering from being able to find qualified, and I don't use that word lightly, individuals to work in those positions. We're talking about men and women that will be working on construction sites, heavily involved, need to be very much aware of the crafts that they are overseeing, as well as the environment that they find themselves in. That's not something that we just wanna place anyone in that environment. So what did we do? We worked with personnel, and we were able to come up with a position called inspector trainee. We currently have 26 inspector trainees, unheard of along with 12 inspectors that we recently hired that are going through training right now. I say all that to say to have 38 individuals that are being trained to do this profession, bringing on inspectors in the midst of that was challenging, but because we couldn't find any on the list, our approach was we will create them ourselves. Mm -hmm. We will create a type of apprenticeship program, and in doing so, we will grow our own inspectors. We wouldn't have these vacancies if we could find individuals, but we could not. Uh, if we could have, we wouldn't be here because our positions would be filled because the work is there. And not only is the work there, but it's work that is going to not rely on the general fund, but I would argue add to the general fund. Um, so that's where we are. We have positions, roughly 13, that have been vacant over two years. Um, some of that speaks to that. Um, but it was my call, no one else's. I, I could have said I'll work from the top down and fill executive positions, but for us, we wanted to fill those frontline entry positions where the work was needed. Clearly, we see what's happening at the airport with respect to its push to respond and be ready for the Olympics, as well as private industry. And we wanted to make sure that we had our base covered as best we could. Thank you. So looking at the CIO's list of 2000, uh, you have, they describe you as having 54 vacancies, of which 42 they're proposing, they, it's only a proposal to cut, leaving you 12. 
And your position on the vast majority of those 42 is that not that they're specially funded, but they're revenue producing. Most certainly. Revenue producing back to the general fund. Yes. And given what you said, and this is again why it's going to be so important for us to see classification by classification, comparing your list, thank you very much, to this list, is uh, you are saying that generally these are not entry-level positions, but these are going to be folks in the middle of the order? Yes. What, what we don't have, there, there are some departments that have the luxury of not having to go through the civil service process. So as a result, they can go and hire. And entry level is not a challenge for them. For us, it was. That's one of the reasons why I was such a supporter of the bridge to jobs uh, opportunity, because it helped us, no disrespect to the civil service process, but sidestep that and be able to bring individuals on and start training them and meet the demand that existed. I mean, we have proprietary departments that they've grown weary of us not being able to fill positions because we have not been able to find people. And we're not the only department that will share that story with you from a technical standpoint. Dare I speak for building and safety, but there's certain classifications in the inspection ranks. It's very difficult to find individuals. So our approach, again, was we will create them. We will train them, we will groom them, we will prepare them. And I think it works pretty good because I myself came through the assistant inspector training program. Mm -hmm. So we are committed to that, but that takes time. And so that's why I argue the age of a vacant position should not be something that's given great consideration. I think the general managers are doing what they can to meet the need and the response to those who are asking for service delivery in their requisite areas. And that could have a lot to do with why a position has been vacant for a period of time. Give us a number that you want us to hit, recognizing that we have issues. Give right. us a number and let us figure out how we can do that. That will require, in many respects, revisiting certain programs. Mm -hmm. We too have a program, we call it our construction workforce schedule. Every project that we have and program that we have on a regular basis, we're monitoring it because we recognize programs will slide with respect to when a project starts. Um, some will even be eliminated due to funding. We're one of those departments that we provide support. So it's difficult for me to know today um, how many of those vacant positions I will actually need on, until I see what other departments are going to be funded. But if no programs are going to stop, if they're going to continue as we've been told they were, then every position that we have there is critical and important because of the role that we play to ensure as a public witness, we are making sure that public works construction projects, be it public or private, are done safely. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I appreciate too that given that point, you, your table gives us a description of service area. I'm gonna ask my team when this information comes back from the CIO, we'll probably also wanna know the service area because wage theft versus public right of way versus the different functions. I realize these are classifications that go from function to function to function. I don't have any further questions. Colleague? I just made the same observation um, because in looking at your report, I, I noticed that you don't have too many that are listed as special, special funds. So does that mean that those that are funded by special funds for your department are, are filled? Is that where we don't see very many? Well, no, it doesn't like, necessarily Or do you even mean, have any? I mean, like, is there special f funds that you're getting from the state for wage theft? No. No. So we, we do have, there are two positions that are listed on here that are with a proprietary department. Uh, they would be fully funded. They are wage theft related. Uh, their costs would be fully funded. No further questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate your, your comments and your report. Very helpful. And we will... Continue this item without objection, and we will call up the next Thank you. group, sanitation. L.A. San, you ready? And again, thank you, everyone, for your, your patience. I know this is a long meeting, but I also understand how critically important it is to each one of you as professionals running your departments and, and bureaus. Good, Good morning. morning. Barbara Romero, General Manager of L.A. Sanitation and Environment. CFO for sanitation. Thank you. And I have my whole crew back there because, as you know, we, we're a really big department yep. here for the city of Los Angeles. Yep. Um, they'll be here uh, to help answer any other questions. So first I want to uh, thank the committee uh, for your attention to this issue. 
Um, as you know, we're one of the uh, biggest bureaus at uh, Public Works uh, with the largest workforce, but that means we also have one of the highest vacancy rates um, in, in, the, um, in the city. Um, here, at our primary responsibility, as you know, is protecting our public health and the environment, and this is a huge responsibility that um, we all take much pride in. Um, I just want to end a couple things. LA, you know, we provide non-deferrable services and it requires, and we also do a lot of work to meet regulatory requirements that drive our workforce. Uh -huh. And so I want to say thank you uh, for your support with a lot of our frontline staff, with a lot of our, our staff out and for protecting those positions. But I also want to put attention that when we were looking at this and you ask, did we work with the CAO? Absolutely we did. Is it, was it a hard decision? Yes, especially when you have a big family. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, how do you pick your favorites? Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't an easy process, but I agree with um, my colleagues like, um, you know, like Reamer in terms of allowing us that flexibility. You know, it is clear that they came to a number, but that number, so we don't know what those positions are, and we won't know what those positions are until Oh, you don't the, know either? No, because, well, we know the positions, but not the specific right. positions. There's so many, as you saw, we have 280 positions. Yep, yep. Um, and what, what I mean by that is, until the mayor's budget is released, we won't know what it looks like. So what these scenarios that we're giving you here of what potential service impacts, what our vacancy rates are, is 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 a is partial until we really see because um, we don't we didn't see when we talk about RCTOs we've been hiring RCTOs you know are some of them you know longer than others mm -hmm. yes but how many what positions are there the ones in you know an RCTO works in LSD we also have L RCTOs in. Um, in collections, and then we have like an ambassador program. So we're anticipating it could be the new programs, yep. but we don't, you know, we don't really know. And so I just wanted to make that up front and be clear that what we're sharing here is still, you know, is in the, the CAO's report, but it's not in the mayor's budget. So it's still speculative, you know, right. some of it. Right. Um, but I just want to address two things, and then I'm going to turn it over, so she, you know, um, to walk over with some of the numbers. First, when we talk about uh, the the time frame of how many, you know, does it have service impacts? Well, there's a couple of things that not only does it have service impacts if those positions positions have been vacant, but how it, it has impacts to staff because uh, and morale and the amount of overtime that we're having to use because of our high vacancy rate, because we have non-deferrable programs within sanitation. Mm -hmm. It also has an impact on the equipment because we're working that equipment, so there's a cost there. And then um, with those vacancies, there's also, if we are looking to eliminate them, there is an impact because of attrition. We can't. We can't catch up. We, as, as the report includes, we have an aggressive um, hiring schedule and we tried to hire very aggressively these last couple years. Um, and, but we can't keep up our net, you know, with attrition, with people going to other departments like, um, and retirements, that doing the elimination has, has a cost to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, that we have to take into account. And then just um, lastly, before I turn it over, is when we're look, we're also, we also have different requirements because we're approximately, and uh, Sarai can, uh, can clarify for me, but I, we're over 85% special funded. Um, but, a, and, but our requirements for salary savings are all different in each of the special funds. Oh. So they vary between three to 12% in salary savings. So- Do you achieve salary savings by um, holding positions open or by sort of the, 
what we call you know the float, the arbitrage. You know, you have positions are open and for a period of time, and, and and through that you achieve some of the savings. Both, both, both. depending then, on the funding. So you do works. actually do hold some positions. We do vacant. Yeah. Um, so, with that, um, I'd like to um, again say thank you um, and turn it over to Sarai to give you the the real numbers. The real numbers. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. I just wanted to bring up another a point um, for consideration, and that is that there's another consequence for long-term vacancies and for deleting positions in that what I have seen is this loss of institutional knowledge, and I know that there are working groups where we're talking about that yeah. across the city, and that loss of institutional knowledge has resulted in a lot of inefficiencies where staff just don't know how to mm -hmm. process things, and so there's there are service impacts from that in addition to just the vacant positions. It's, it's the loss of knowledge that um, we've yeah. now incurred from SIP and ERIP and, and all these other programs. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, uh, but before you go back, in terms of the two-year time, you know, that, that is, if, if it, it takes two years to hire somebody at the city, if by the time you get it in the budget, by the time it goes into work day, you know, if we're lucky a year and a half, so if we're going to take time consideration, I think uh, a fair way is, is looking at, because a lot of the things that it, for two years, we w don't want it to be two years, but it's stuff that's out of our control, that if there's not a list, it's to, it's to, as it's included in our report, there's not a list, the list expires, you know, we need some, tip, you know, we, like for the RCTOs, we can only hire 20 people at a time because the equipment and the type of trainers, training that it requires. So there's some limitations and things that are out of control that if we're gonna look at time, it should be a longer time than two years. So I'll just run through the numbers very, very quickly. As, okay. as Barbara mentioned, we have 3,807 total authorized positions. Mm -hmm. uh, based on our last data, we have 768 vacancies uh, that consists of 540 regular authorities and 204 resolution authorities. So we have a, a vacancy rate right now of 19.85%. Mm -hmm. um, as she mentioned, the vast majority of our positions are special funded. Uh, so we have salary savings rates that range from 3% to 12.9%. Uh, we have submitted 39 unfreeze requests for the PCH process. Uh, two have been approved, four have been denied, the remainder are pending, and we have an additional 47 that we are doing an internal review uh, so we can prioritize internally what we want to go forward first, yeah. and we anticipate submitting those uh, to the process in the near future. Yeah. Uh, in the same time period, we have hired 230 new staff. We've had 70 transfers in from other departments for a total of 300 uh, new uh, individuals. But at the same time, we've lost 103 transfers to other departments, primarily to DWP, which yeah. is a big competition, a big yeah. issue for us. Um, We've had 59 transfer to other departments, and we've had 65 retirements for a total loss of 227 positions. So our net gain has only been 73 hires uh, yeah. to date. Uh, right now we have six, uh, 67 positions that are pending conditional job offers. So this is job offers that were made uh, before the PCH process uh, was implemented, and also for positions that were exempted from PCH, so like right. the uh, positions for our livability services, wastewater uh, treatment operators, uh, and such. So, um, you know, as as Barbara mentioned, the challenges are the exhausted lists. We've we've used up our our, our lists, so we don't have positions we can call up. Um, we don't have adequate training capacity for some of the positions that we would want to fill. So those are all contributing factors to why some of these positions remain vacant. Right, right. So, you ready? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, you have relatively few, given the 700 vacancies, you have relatively few uh, PCH requests, and that's because so much of your department was exempted, correct? That was our understanding, yes. That was your understanding. And then we come to today's report, and of your nearly 300 positions to be eliminated, we know that a substantial number of those, probably 150, uh, close to 150. Oh, no, no, excuse me. 
least 100 of them would otherwise have been exempted. And that's in the category of, we do know, we do know that it's refuse collection uh, two, uh, truck operator two, wastewater collection supervisor, again, they're just recommendations, and wastewater collection two, wastewater collection worker two are being recommended for, for uh, elimination. Those are, those are, how are those funded? Those are 100% special funded by the Sewer Construction and Maintenance Fund. Is the Sewer Construction and Maintenance Fund subsidized by the city? No. It's, it's whole? Yes. Oh. And interestingly enough, I think uh, a lot of those positions are like entry level positions. And one of the things that we have aggressively increased our, our numbers is through all the equity programs like TLH, Bridge to Jobs, Clean LA, and it's through those positions. It's one of the, the um, opportunities in when, we, when general managers talk about flexibility. We have, when we had that many vacancies, we were able to use those entry level vacancies for these other you know, Bridge to Jobs programs because we had the flexibility. When they get eliminated, we're not gonna have that flexibility of hiring in lieu these, the, for these training programs we're going to have to, you know, stick to just hiring off the list and not, you know, we're not going to we're not going to be able to be as aggressive in the clean LA, in the bridge to jobs programs, in all these entry level equity based uh, workforce um, pathway programs that we that um, that the city has made available. Thank you. Well, once again, I'm, this is going to be a constant theme. I'm looking forward to more than just these three categories. Looking forward to the list of classifications, what jobs are we talking about, uh, how long they've been open. And this is coming from the CIO. After the, after the budget is rolled out, we'll have that separate sheet, and we just want to compare it to the information you've given us. I don't have further questions. Colleague? No questions. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. you being here. Uh, we will continue this item, or this portion, and we will move to street lighting. We have, just if you're keeping score at home, we have street lighting, we have street services, we have transportation, and we have planning. And if you think you're speaking today and I didn't call you out, okay, good. So I think we have it right. Street lighting. Go right ahead. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Miguel Sanglang, Director of your Street Lighting. I am joined by the ever authoritative, authoritative Megan Hackney and the ever accurate Mark uh, uh, Yamamura. Um, I'll go over some of the facts in our report and then give other uh, tidbits for, for context. As you see in the report, we have a total of 409 positions in the Bureau of Sheet Lighting, four of which are um, used for substitute, substitute authorities. Um, currently, it shows in Workday that we have about 79 positions. Um, we do think that the CAO's report is more accurate um, with the 67 or so, uh -huh. um, given our Workday uh, implementation needs more work. Um, we're uh, happy to report that, that is actually a, a big difference from what we were at the end of calendar year 23, where we actually saw closer to 140 vacancies within our bureau. Uh -huh. uh, and so we've dropped that in half. We went from around uh, over 30% uh, vacancy, probably first or second in the city, uh, to around 16% now for our vacancy rate. Um, of those, uh, it, it ranges from uh, different types of positions, uh, a bulk of which are our field positions that are currently vacant uh, at around 46 or so. Um, another bulk uh, is from our engineering um, uh, uh, engineering groups that do support work for many of the other projects that go on through the city and the smattering of others that are from our administrative or IT or other support positions within the, uh, within the realm. Uh, I'd also like to point out though for, for this, you know, as a bureau we've grown significantly from uh, 2000, uh, 2020, 21 fiscal year to, to date. Um, in, in that context, we had actually about $39.7 million budget. We grew to $56.7 uh, million budget uh, with the, 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 uh, the, the related positions. Uh, that has been, though, uh, um, because of the issues of theft and vandalism that we've been seeing throughout the city around our street lights. Um, and we have been, because of the uh, and you had uh, asked the board earlier uh, 
uh, council member about healthy funds. We are relatively unhealthy when it comes to the street lighting maintenance assessment fund. So right. we've been increasingly reliant on the general fund and other funds in order to, to pri provide resources for our bureau. Um, with that, uh, there are uh, some things that uh, I'd like to point out too where you know, are under the administrative and executive positions for our, our group. Um, many of the positions uh, or some of the positions that we're talking about here are high-level positions within the Bureau. So this is our chief management analyst. We have two senior, um, uh, senior street lighting engineers. Uh, that constitutes half of my executive staff. We have currently people working in acting positions that are uh, doing that work. Uh, and would like to, to try and figure out how to, to deal with something that would leave us a little bit hampered when it comes to executive management. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. I think you, you answered the sort of the hot core of this is that you have, according to the CAO, you have 67 vacant positions, 66 to be eliminated, leaving one open position. According to your report, 100% of those positions, all 67 or whatever the vacancy is, are all specially funded. It leads to the question, what do we gain? Uh, and you answer the question because the street lighting, the special fund is not healthy and it's subsidized by the general fund. Right. Did I have that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, so today, today, uh, putting aside the, the 67 positions, what's, what is sort of the percentage of general fund subsidy to the, all of your positions? Rough, just in rough numbers. This is going to be all hashed out in the next couple weeks. Yeah, they the general fund just subsidizes part of related costs. I'm sorry, right into the microphone. I'm sorry. The general fund subsidizes just part of our related costs. That's right. why they call it general fund subsidized. Right. Do you know what, do you, could you venture a, a educated guess on what the percentage is against your total uh, payroll? Uh, I would have to look into that. Okay. We so we can come back with you. It'd be something we'd be really at least 10%. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it, it's 100% going to be about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, question? No question. That was my question. Thank you very much. I mean, I know that, um, well, actually, actually, I do have a question. Uh, my sense is that the rapid growth in the positions, we're responding to real issues. I mean, really critically, deeply critical issues, fortifying our lights, you know, rep repairing and replacing our lights, innovating our lights, lighting up in more creative ways, our underpasses. It's all related to public safety. Um, can you just reflect on that? I mean, where, where has your growth been? The, the challenges that we would face with the, the vacancies that we have that are on our report is the fact that 25% of our essential crew, crew leaders would be uh, vacant positions, right? So that, that would kind of cut us from 60 crews that we can field to about 45. So um, that would be a real loss of strength in the field that we would have. We'd be able to we'd be having a harder time uh, trying to respond to all those issues that have been coming Wait, up. Wait, I want to check you on that. Are you saying that eliminating vacant positions would eliminate actual human beings in the field? No, no, no. Uh, those positions are ones that are currently unfilled. Right. But those are um, our, our crew lead positions right. that lead crews within um, yeah. the bureau outside and are, when we deploy them. Sorry. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is, you know, without those crew leads, we would have a harder time fielding even more staff um, or, yeah. and more crews to repair our lights, per what you asked about with regards to services. Right, right, uh, right. Okay. Very good. A point well taken, but I just wanted to be really, really clear. I don't want any, I don't want to imply that cutting a vacant position changes the number of folks who are out in the field. Not to say we don't need more people out in the field. Correct. The, the cutting of vac these uh, current vacant positions would not affect the, the number we deploy. Right. Um, currently, right. it does affect um, our ability to field additional staff should we desire that in the future, Correct. right? Uh, Correct. And also makes it harder for us to then um, augment whatever services that we would ha would like to augment in the future. Correct. Correct. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate you. Bureau of Street Services. Good afternoon, committee members. Stephanie Clements, Assistant Director, Department of Public Works, Bureau of Street Services, also known as Streets LA. I have with me today Melinda Chow, our Administrative Services Division Manager, and also some Streets LA VIPs in the audience to assist. 
We are here to present and answer questions regarding the Streets LA report back on vacancies. As identified in the report back, the Bureau has 1,560 positions authorized in the 2023 adopted budget. As of March 23rd, the Bureau had 388 vacancies, which is about a 25% vacancy rate. That will be reduced to 21% once all of the pending offers, job offers that were made prior to prioritized critical hiring or PCH are finalized and staff are onboarded. Before PCH, like many other departments, Streets LA was making a lot of progress in further reducing our vacancy rate. And as mentioned, um, it should be down 21% shortly. But in addition to that, we had many uh, pending hiring processes in the queue that would have further reduced our vacancy rate. But at this time, all of those hiring processes are on hold. Uh, and the simple explanation why vacancy rates remained high at Street Soleil and in other city departments is that there are just not sufficient eligible lists of candidates to hire from. There is either no list of candidates at all, so we can't hire permanent employees, or the lists that are established don't have sufficient candidates. And in many cases, as you know, even when there are lists, we are competing with other city departments, including DWP. And you're all very aware of the ongoing salary par parity issues with DWP, and so DWP continues to hire, and many of our trained staff promote to DWP, creating further attrition. For Streets LA, we have 99 different classifications authorized in our budget, and that means the personnel department has to create 99 separate and eligible lists of candidates. And due to the current nature of the civil service process, the personnel department doesn't have the capacity needed to keep up with the demand at the Bureau to maintain all of these lists. So we just can't hire a lot of our key classifications yet prior to PCH. In terms of our salary savings rate, our budget is funded by the general fund and various special funds. Our general fund salary savings rate is 8%, and our special fund salary savings rate is 4.3%. That equates to about 76 positions that must be held vacant or frozen and can't be filled. Uh, as mentioned by the GSD general manager at your last committee meeting on vacancies, departments also have unfunded payouts every year that have to be paid with salary savings in the form of MOU bonuses, annual sick time payouts, and also pay, uh, substantial sick and vacation payouts that are paid out upon uh, retirement. These expenses are typically unfunded and by default are paid through salary savings. And regarding the proposed elimination of 229 positions, uh, while we fully recognize the city's budgetary constraints, if those positions are cut, and as mentioned by many previous departments, um, there will be an impact to our services. And that's because we have been using our salary savings funding to pay for overtime expenses to pay for hiring hall salaries, to pay for hiring hall overtime, and also to um, pay for uh, underfunded uh, expenses in our expense accounts. Mm -hmm. So if the 229 positions are cut along with the salary funding, we may have significantly less funding to perform work on overtime, to hire hiring hall, to supplement our vacancies and our crews, and to address shortages in our non-salary accounts. As many departments today, we are requesting as much hiring flexibility as possible, uh, and we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, in the PCH process, it looks like you put in 110, and they're all pending, so you haven't gotten any results from that. Correct. Although the the clock runs out, out on that, and you're going to see the now you're going to see this report. You don't know what the classifications are, but you can probably imagine what they are, and we'll see it in the budget in the next two weeks. And your point, thank you. You articulated very well the point that I was trying to make, that eliminating the positions is not just eliminating vacant positions. It means less money into your budget, which I always presume gets used for something for the good of the people. And in your case, you articulated some of those, some of those things. Um, do you, uh, do you have a sense of what, on the, on the list of 2,000, it looks like, um, and you said it, it looks like 229 eliminated with leaving you 146. 
you have a sense of what those 229 are? We have a list of positions and programs, but we don't have, as Barbara mentioned, specific position numbers, so we yeah. don't exactly know where the cuts are, but we do have a list of the positions. Yeah, and I would imagine when you look, when you look at your list of vacant positions, given the Sophie's Choice, I mean, you would have input on what would be least, the least painful to go and what would be the most painful to go. And you've articulated all of those? Uh, you've let the CIO and the, the folks putting together the budget know that? We have, but now that we have the list, I like what Mr. Reamer said, that we would, you know, ideally in terms of flexibility, if there's a certain uh, amount of money that needs to be cut, we'd right. love to provide additional input. Right. Because right, right now the, the cuts are not very strategic. It's one person from this crew, it's three people from that right. crew. Right. So, um, so for efficiency's sake and for the most efficient delivery of services, you'd want to be able to have flexibility or the ability to move some of those positions that are saved around, meaning moving some of the positions that are eliminated also around. Yes, correct. And uh, our city engineer mentioned that too. It would it, yeah. be nice to, to do that. Even yeah. if the position is filled, we can move positions yeah. around and it's have the it theme. be more let strategic. Manage, let managers manage. Colleague? No questions, but I did, similar to you, find it fascinating that you guys were put 110 at PCH and then have been uh, deter determined. So I'll be following that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I, I appreciate everyone. Now that we are in the afternoon, I appreciate everyone hanging in there with us. Um, next, we're going to continue this item, and next we'll turn to DOT. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair, Council Member Padilla. Uh, joining me today, oh, Laura Rubio Cornejo, General Manager of the Department of Transportation. Joining me to my right is Cydia Reese. She is the Acting Chief Management Analyst of our Bureau of Employee Engagement and Performance. To my left is Roy Cervantes, Chief Management Analyst overseeing uh, our Administration and Budget Bureau within the department. Um, similarly, as with every other general manager, I appreciate the opportunity to address this body and share DOT's experience um, through this exercise. In fiscal year 20, the current fiscal year 23-24, the department was authorized uh, for 100, I'm sorry, 1,830 positions, combination of regular and resolution authorities. Uh -huh. Um, effective February 2024, our vacancy rate stood at 18%. This was an improvement over post-COVID where our vacancy rate hovered around 24%. So a lot was done in a short period to try to fill as many positions as possible. We currently have 128 conditional job offers that have been extended prior to the PCH process being initiated and they are all at various stages of being onboarded. As it relates to PCH specifically, we have submitted 61 requests, and I'm happy to walk you through those. Um, and we have an additional 42 that we are preparing to be submitted for consideration. Um, of the 61, and don't worry, there aren't actually 61, some of these are grouped, yep. um, so I'll just briefly cover what they are. Our payroll supervisor, um, was is under review we have not had a hearing yet although we have received some questions um, that payroll supervisor candidate received their conditional job offer back in mid-february and so we are still waiting to hear from the pch committee as to whether it will be approved or denied critical obviously supports payroll workday implementation and any other administrative functions within the department we have 38 senior traffic supervisor positions that were submitted um, critical to public safety, traffic uh, control, and parking enforcement. Mm -hmm. One safety engineer that works with our risk management, management team um, in really reducing our liability. We have a senior accountant position that is uh, supported and funded through our Metro Annual Work Plan. We have one senior communications operator, level two, which supports our parking enforcement team with communications out into the field. We have 14 traffic paint, 
painter and sign poster level one positions um, that would be uh, hired through the local hiring and jobs to bridge program. Obviously supporting public safety and critical infrastructure that all of your constituents see on a day-to-day -day basis. We also have uh, five traffic painter and sign poster level two positions also through the local hire and bridge to jobs program. And lastly, we have three. Yeah, we have three um, traffic supervisors um, and one senior accountant um, that was submitted that are all funded through the Metro Annual Work Program. As, have, as other general managers have indicated, we are anxiously awaiting the mayor's recommended budget so that we have a full understanding of what the true impacts will be to the positions within our department. That said, in anticipation and understanding that we are really looking at a financial um, crisis and vacancies have to be um, eliminated in order for us to be able to balance the budget, internally we have already started looking at what our core services must be. Mm -hmm. So really looking at what, if something has to be eliminated, what does that mean for services that we provide Angelinos? And so having those really difficult conversations as a transportation department, what our core services are to the constituents that we serve. We are also looking at what our current response times are for requests and what our backlogs are and what the potential impacts to those might be. And lastly, we started to look further out into the horizon, how future retirements may impact our department and how, do, how can we start preparing now in anticipation of potential retirements and as was indicated, what that loss of institutional knowledge might mean for our efficiency, productivity, and being able to prepare right now for that eventuality. I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Thanks very much. A couple of observations. You know, when you look at a list like, when the list is longer, when the department's bigger, you see it's easier to follow patterns. You know, you have a lot of, a lot of positions that are funded through Prop A, Prop C, Measure M, um, and of course, the, my expectation, if we're wise, that we will focus on making sure we retain those positions so that we can fill them. But it does raise the question, if we, don't, if we have large numbers of vacancies in A and C and Measure M, does that mean those projects aren't moving forward? So our commitment is that any projects that are being funded through Prop A, C, similarly any grant funded projects, so if it's an ATP project or yeah. any other state or federal grant project, we are committed to seeing those projects through. What it limits is our capacity to be able to uh, pursue additional grant funding for additional projects until we clear the deck. Um, I will also share that keeping in mind we are the same teams that are uh, delivering um, those projects that make our streets safer are also working on projects to deliver uh, in time for the Olympics. We are also pivoting to a post-HLA implementation world. And so all of that is being taken into consideration as we're looking at what our core services are with the staff we do have um, in anticipation of vacancies not being uh, there to fill. And that raises the question, thank you very much for that. I, I appreciate that. But if we're gonna focus on specially funded positions like from, for A or C or M or any other you know, funded positions, and other positions need to be eliminated. The two gigantic categories that you have are uh, basically associated with meters and parking collections, which is a revenue producer, theoretically, if it's done right. Correct. And, um, and then traffic safety, that is always generally funded, but is in the public safety category. And I, I fear with a department like yours, the squeeze, that we'll fill positions that are specially funded and then we will it will necessarily put out in the cold generally funded positions that are, so, that are critically important. The white gloves are critically important. Do you have a, when, as you had these CIO conversations, do you have a sense, give me the sense of how you prioritize those competing factors, those competing goals, and where do you think the CIO is coming out on the recommendation? If I've said it once, I said it 100 times, it's just a recommendation. Right. Of the 105 uh, positions that are being recommended to be eliminated, approximately 63 are for traffic control parking enforcement officers. To your point, Chair, those are revenue generating. Not only do they fully fund uh, the positions themselves, but they also add to the general fund. And so 
to answer your question, yes, uh, I have reached out to the CAO's office and made some recommendations as it relates to those positions. Yeah. Okay. Um, colleague. Um, I'm curious, um, are you similar to other colleagues uh, dealing with challenges of, of list availability to fill some of these special Special Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll start off and then I'll hand it over, your, over to City of Reist, who really deals more intimately with the hiring challenges and coordinates with personnel. Um, as, as you've heard, there's, you know, one, whether there's a list available for us to even pull from. But as you've heard, some of the most critical positions that I think are fundamental to the services that your constituents expect and deserve are those that are the most difficult to fill. Field services, those skilled trades, um, parking enforcement it has also been traditionally somewhat challenging. And so those are the positions that we continue to try to recruit, be creative, a bridge to jobs, local hire. We continue to look for partnerships with local schools where we can have a pipeline from, let's say, LA Trade Tech, for example, who we've engaged not too long ago to have those type of relationships because those are critical positions um, but very difficult to fill. And then I'll hand it over to Sidia to kind of provide a little bit more perspective on some of the challenges. Yeah, in terms of list availability, uh, we've gone through several management accountant lists account and, and accounting lists. We're in the process of trying to onboard nine accountants that will help uh, collect revenue as well. Um, and we've had some instances in which emergency appointments have been extended for more than a year, up to two years, because of the lack of a list being available. Thank you. No further questions. I don't have further questions. I mean, this is going to be, I mean, you, your, your chart illustrates the challenge for, for me as we look at, you know, what is specially funded, why aren't they filled if they're specially funded, and I thank you for your answer. Um, and then that puts the squeeze on those generally funded positions and we got to make decisions as to whether or not they are, whether we put a pri higher priority on revenue producing or some other important city activity. And then if it is revenue producing, I think we're gonna wanna ask the question, which we can't do right here, is it really producing that revenue? Mm -hmm. All right, thanks very much. Great. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, planning. <laughs> You know, I, I, as, the, as the minutes tick by and I see folks sitting in the audience, I'm thinking to myself, man, there's stuff I want them to be doing in my district, and I'm sorry to have you waiting here for two and a half hours. But I do appreciate you being here. I appreciate your report, and I'll give you a chance to jump right into it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Koskar and uh, Councilmember Bidia. Um, Vince Bertoni, Director of Planning. I have with me this, at, this morning or afternoon. To your left, uh, Heidi Rito Lopez, our Deputy Director for Operations Engagement. To your right, uh, Annalyn Rocio, who is our Senior Chief Management Analyst. And then next to her is Lynn, Lee Lamb, Senior Management Analyst, too. So thank you very much for having this opportunity to, um, to address the committee. Um, the Planning Department, and just if you just kind of look at the numbers, we have 578 authorized positions, mm -hmm. um, 419 are regular authority, and 157 are resolution, and two are sub-authorities. As of, and this is always that point in time um, that we're talking about, as of March 29th of this year, we had 109 vacancies, which is an 18.9% vacancy rate. However, um, 17 of the are in the process of being filled, so we have conditional job offers um, as part of those. And 45%, excuse me, 45 positions are being held vacant to meet our 8% salary savings. So we're above the 5% target, we're at 8% for our department. So this results in an adjusted vacancy count of 47 positions and an adjusted vacancy rate of 8.8%. So you back out our 8% um, salary savings, we're roughly 8.8% um, um, vacant. Um, in terms of the priority critical hiring, or PCH, um, a total of seven, we submitted for 20 positions, seven were approved, um, but out of those seven, four of those positions were existing staff that were filled, uh, filling emergency appointment or acting pay. So three of them were actually actual vacancies that we were able to, to fill. Um, and we have eight requests that have been denied um, and five that are on hold. Um, in terms of the funding breakdown for our department, um, we are 75, excuse me, we're on 74% special fund um, and then 26% general fund. 
and you'll hear um, departments say that means we're not healthy special fund, which means that we do rely upon some general fund subsidy, and I think that's pretty much uh, most, if not all, of the departments that are before you are in, the, in that situation that have special, if they have special funds, it's because they're, they're not considered healthy. But it's the vast, almost three quarters of, of our budget is special fund. Now, one thing that may be a little different is almost all of our special funds are fees for services. So we're not relying upon other grants. So those yeah. fees for services are fees um, that we charge, fees or surcharges that we charge directly for a planning application or they're a surge charge that may apply both to the planning application as well as the building permit. Yeah. So that's where we, we generate the 74% almost entirely. There's a small, exe small exceptions, but largely through that. Um, and I say that in the sense that if you look at cost recovery in a department like ours, it is really more of a question about how much can you legally charge, and you can actually charge much higher than that, but also how much do you think you should charge, um, how much do you think is the obligation of a, an applicant before the city, and how much is the oblig how much is really to the public benefit that the general fund should pay for? So that's always the balancing act, and because there is a process to adjust those fees up or down as we go through there. Um, I would say in terms of the vacancies and how we got to the um, vacant vacancy proposal from the CAO for elimination, there was 14 positions that were recommended for elimination. Um, there was a conversation that occurred, although it was, it, it was necessarily brief because obviously we have charter mandated um, deadlines for the budget that we had to meet. Um, we think that we had, the, we think that we've had a very clear and productive conversation with the CA's office since we started this budget process going into middle of last year that um, when we saw when we saw the positions that they had recommended um, we understood where they were coming from and we felt that it reflected a balance I think that um, I think as it met, has um, been mentioned by other general managers of course we believe very strongly in the mission of our department um, we're very passionate about the mission of our department, so we feel, so we, we would not want to see any cuts to it because of, of the passion that we have for that. But we do understand this issue of shared sacrifice, and so we do understand where, where the positions came from. I would say that if, I were to, if we were to look at what the difference would be in terms of what we would recommend for elimination and yeah. this CAO would recommend for elimination, I think we look primarily through the lens of, of our work programs and they had to balance the work programs with certain funding needs. Um, but we do believe, because of the strong dialogue we've had with the CAO, that they understood our operation, they understand our business. I think that they um, did um, a good job of trying to balance where those um, vacancies was, would come from. And I think they did it in a way that, now we have to see what those, what, what ultimately will occur, it's hard to, we can't predict because we don't know what the mayor's budget, these haven't been approved, the, yeah. the yeah. budget has not come out, but they've given us a place to work. When it comes to the vacancies in general, um, one thing that I'd emphasize is that you hear a lot about lists, and I would say that our vacancy rate is largely due to lists, and I would also say that it's hard to look at our vacancies from an aging of vacancies, like how long have they been vacant. Um, because of you have to look at what your what your priorities are as a department, but yes, we do have an issue um, about being able to hire fast enough. But ours is a little different. Um, roughly 72 to 74 percent of the positions in our department are within the planning series or planners, planning assistant, all the way up to principal planner and associate zoning administrator. What that means is, is that until you get to the deputy director level or the the assistant general manager, the general manager level, it's all promotion. And so what happens is when you have the higher level, the principal planner, you don't just hire that one time, mm -hmm. you hire it five times because you've got to backfill to a senior planner, backfill to the city planner, et cetera, et cetera. So what it means is our vacancies take a long time to fill. And as we went into this, you know, as we went into this year um, in terms of the vacancies, um, we were very, su we were successful to hire and promote. We promoted, we did as, this fiscal year, we've done 57 promotions and 69 new hires, which is a total of 126 hires, either promotion or hiring. That's out of the Department of 578. We did 126, which is, which 
which is very sizable. However, we lost 41, so our net, and we did 57 promotions, so our net increase was 28 people. So we only increased 28 people over a fiscal year, um, largely because of the need for promotions. Um, I would say that, you know, when you look at alternatives to that, I mean, one of the things, right, sometimes you're able to fill quicker in other departments is you hire a senior management analyst that will come from another department, right? Ours all, again, nearly three quarters of ours are promotions, right? Um, having said that though, you know, we look at the system in terms of, if you look at the outcomes in terms of the staff we're able to promote and hire versus the vacancy rate, mm -hmm. we have been very successful in this, the current system of having our existing positions be promotional mm -hmm. because of the nature of the work, the nature of the city, and when we have lists come up, I will tell you that almost every time we have a list that's established and it's part way through, we have more people that we would like to promote than we have positions available typically when it gets there because and it, it approached so because it talks to mm -hmm. really the ability that we've had in terms of being able to grow and, and, and grow our employees and, and right. really work on that. So we're not asking to have open lists to hire from outside. Um, because we actually think that we would largely have the same result in terms of qualified candidates. But what would be helpful is to be able to have those lists go more quickly. And I know we worked with personnel on that. So I think that's an important point okay. on there. And then the other thing I would, I would say is what happens with these vacancies? What happens with, you know, what if we eliminate vacancies, what does that mean to our work program? Because they're not filled. Um, I would just offer a few things. Um, one of them is that in, our, in the work we do, I would say there's two major areas. One of them is project planning and the other is policy. Mm -hmm. In the project planning area, our workload is very variable. And so being able to fill a position when you need it is very important because, because of the fluctuation of the work. Um, so that, that's one of the issues with the, the vacancies. If we, if we eliminate vacancies in project planning and we hit an upturn, we're not going to be able to adjust to it. So we're going to, it's, which will have an impact on things such as getting housing projects approved, the housing crisis, mm -hmm. um, assisting small business and, and so forth. So I think that's something important. The other part is the policy area because policy, as you know, takes many years, always more years than we'd like it to take. But mm -hmm. how we typically will, will staff up is in the beginning of taking on a major policy item, like a community plan, a, a transit community, a transit, transit word, commu um, community plan, um, we usually begin with m more minimal staffing because we're largely doing background work and community engagement. But it has, that has to ramp up over time. Uh -huh. And so what you'll start to see is a ramping up over time where we'll need to start filling the, the positions or paying for consultants. So, so I would just offer that. Um, and also some, when we hold positions vacant in policy areas that we, have on the, that we have on the books, we're anticipating filling them. So when we talk about timelines for plans, and we may give you a timeline, mm -hmm. we're giving you a timeline with that, est with that um, assumption that we're going to fill the position. Right. So if, for example, something may be taking a little longer now, but we're, on, we're about to hire a planner for it, and we'll be able to fill this position, so we'll be able to have it speed up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in general, when you look at the vacancies, if they're not filled, what it does is it may be, it, even though it's People, as people not here now, there, there, is, there will be impacts on the future work program. Um, I'll leave it at that because I know I'm standing between you all and, and lunch and happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much and I appreciate it. Um, actually for all of the departments and the combination of the size of your department and the number of vacancies, you probably have, you as a group probably have the clearest picture of where this is all heading. You put in 21 of these PCHs, uh, you know how many were denied, you know how many you with, withdrew. And so there's already nine positions that you have a pretty good sense on. And also, if you take a look at, if you take a look at even the raw list without classifications, it would appear that, that you know, we're sort of circling in on the number, at least as the CIO is concerned. And again, just recommendation, 576 positions, according to them, the 86 vacancies, you described to me the, the we diminish that number by the salary savings because you hold them open proposing 14 positions to be eliminated, leaving 72 open. Right. So you're, you have a pretty clear picture of where you're going. And I understand okay. your point on the flexibility. I mean, the planning department is 
I liken it to the only department I've managed at the city is the city attorney's office, right. where you have right. professionals with right. a degree with right. uh, that are not fungible because you know handling litigation is different than transactional, right. which is different than advisory, which is different from t right. types of litigation. But you know, I do understand taking folks with professional degrees and putting them in positions. I mean, I, I have a sense that what you what your last couple minutes was you're asking for flexibility within those, when there are eliminations. But I would say that today, as a manager, you can probably take a look at the picture and understand where you're gonna be next year. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's accurate and fair. Yeah, thanks. Colleague? Uh, just a, a comment. Um, you know, I hear more often than not, I just kinda wanna put it out there that when your department isn't successful, it has the ability of keeping a lot of revenue from coming into the city. So um, I think it's very important that you continue to, to be on top of figuring out what works and doesn't work because when you're not functional, right. we lose our ability to you know, help everyone, so to speak. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank you. The overview was perfect, what you gave. I really, really do appreciate that. I do think it's important for us to see what when the proposal comes, what these classifications are, we will want input on what that does to your ability to do this critically important thing, as my colleague says, to make sure that we're you know, planning for our future and approving those projects that have cash registers and services for our constituents, um, as well as uh, all the quality of life stuff you do. So thank you for hanging in there for a couple of hours. I don't have any further questions. We will continue this item. And I think with that, we have now gone through each item. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Clerk, is there any other business in front of us? That clears the desk. Okay, to be super clear, what we've just done is we've continued each one of these items. We will roll it back up to another one of these special sessions in a couple of weeks. And we have very clear instructions to the CIO. We'll loop back with the CIO in case there's any lack of clarity on what we're looking for. With that, colleague, thank you so much.